Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Scroll Podcast brought to you by the Adventure Archive. My name is Ryan. I'm Mike Jones. Okay, and today <laughs> we are going to be talking about Overarms. Let's get out of the light there. Uh, this is a tabletop role-playing game that uh, it kind of channels JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Persona, Fate, and Shaman King. And I'm going to be totally honest with you. I've seen uh, one season of JoJo's, and that's it from that list. I've so, seen everything uh, on that list, although I only watched uh, like five or six episodes of Shaman King. It's pretty cool, though. You know, I didn't hate it. Um, I think it's the same artist who did uh, the, the Jing, the King of Bandits, I believe. But point being, you know, I'm super into this game. Yeah, no, I know. At one point, you were even talking about running this for uh, for a uh, table, actually, right? And that's kind of yeah. I actually already have um, the first couple of episodes mapped out, um, so I'm actually fairly ready to run this. Um, I just don't have the time to run anything right now. But yeah, I love this. I, I think this is a great game, and I fucking love JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Um, so yeah, I'm stoked. Um. Awesome. I mean, it's it's a cool game. I read through it, and it, it sounds great. Again, I just haven't read a lot of the other uh, associated bits and pieces. Big anime fan. Uh, apparently are we matching these. today? Are we wearing the same shirt? So. Are you wearing? Uh, fuck yeah, we are. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> yeah, <laughs> guys, we're matching. We didn't even plan this. Uh, for those listening, we are both rocking our um. A world champ games, Adam Vast. Did you get the full? You got the you got the bullet on the sleeve and everything. Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah, matchy matchy. You know. So, uh, so how you doing this morning, dude? Uh, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm a little sleepy. I went to I like was working on a project and then I fell into a TikTok hole at like when I got in bed. And I woke up and I mowed the front lawn because I am uh, a low-functioning adult. So well, how was your go. morning? As we all are. I um, I watched some Euphoria last night. I read this again. I played a couple uh, couple hours of Apex, and then uh, here right. we are. Let's touch base on that. You let's run that back. You watched Euphoria. You're watching Euphoria. Yeah, with Kaylee, it's really good, dude. Oh, I'm not even fucking okay. around. Yeah, yeah. I recommend I it. Don't... I, like I I'm it. sure that they're great actors and the story's really good. It just seems very dramatic for me. I mean, I, oh, I, do watch it's, I mean, it's I it's they're like sixteen year old. I was gonna say they're not. sixteen year old like high school bro, kids. I, of course, it's dramatic. I seen that girl. I seen that girl, Sydney Sweeney, bro. That girl is not sixteen years old. Let me tell you. Well, I mean, you know, sixteen for the show. That's the, also my issue is that like they bring on these like women in their like late teens, early twenties, and make them look super hot. And they're like, oh, they're sixteen. And like. Well, it's weird, that, it's weird that you're making them so sexy on the show if they're 16 because they're children, um, but... Right, but also 16-year-olds well, aren't wearing overalls and scrunchies anymore. So well, give it to also, bro. 16-year-olds aren't, aren't in their 20s, so... Well, listen, this has been a problem forever. <laughs> Unless you're watching, um, what, like Skins or something where they actually have, like, young people doing it and the English version, not the American version? Degrassi, bro. No one was cute well, in yeah, Listen, no, listen. They were all Drake, ugly. Drake, Drake is hard, and he grew up hard on the streets. He wasn't, like, a rich suburban <laughs> Canadian that grew up a child star on TV. So, you know, Degrassi's a lie. I actually anyway, don't think they, they made that much money on Degrassi. I'm sorry, we're good. on a tangent. Tangent. Th this tangent. is a Tabletop Role Playing Game Podcast. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? We can just talk. Um, <laughs> this whole episode we should could. be us chatting. We could. This is a um, just chatting episode, but it's not. Like, like, Ryan and I will get on a phone call, and somehow the phone call will last for like an hour and 45 minutes, and it won't feel long. And I'll look down and be like, oh, we've been talking for like an hour and 30 or something, you know? Yep. So All the time. Yep. That's why we have podcast. <laughs> anyway, so Overarms. Overarms. Cool game. Is your uh, is is... hardback? Yeah. Here's the hard. Okay, cool. Mine's the soft. You got the soft back. So, uh, yeah. actually, Rookie Jet Studio, um, when we did Red Giant, because it Which is the same company that did Red Giant, great, really great game. Really, really love that one a lot. Um, they reached out to us and offered us a review PDF and some um, at cost POD codes for Overarms. Um, and we are getting around to reviewing that finally. Um, and uh, it's super cool. We really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I got a hard cover. You got the soft cover. We got the PDF. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we wanted to go over this again. It's been a while. There's some other stuff that's been popping out. Um, yeah. but it seemed like a good well, time we, to do we this. Missed, we missed a bunch of episodes. So our whole schedule got really pushed back. And then we had like yep. a couple of interviews back to back. And yeah, I'm really stoked to go through this. Um, when, when they kind of 
talk just about it. Um, they were like, yeah, it's like JoJo. And I was re-watching JoJo at the time. So I was really like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, let's do this. So I'm so- There you go. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, um, even though I have not read the specific references in here, I get it. I get them. I've seen other ones in the same genre. Um, and uh, it's definitely a good time. Yeah, right? Who watched a fucking anime? Not us. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and kickstart the podcast. And I have a physical kickstart reward this, this morning. Podcast. Oh, do yeah. you? Yeah, do I, I do. Oh, yeah, you do. I'll get the digital. Bar. I have this. It is called Legend Has It from Adam Bell. This is a super, super cool game. Um, I was very excited for this. Um, it is an anthology myth-making card game where you interpret story prompts pulled from your own books. So you literally take the books off of your shelf and using the cards in here can create stories. So you can literally, you take like lines from different types of books and stuff like that to create the game, which is really awesome. Um, and I got the physical version and the digital version. I know you just got the digital version. I did, um, I regret when, that. Yeah, no, oh, dude, and it's cool because the box is cool. So like when you open the box up, this is the general box. Um, you pop this sucker open. I hate opening boxes like this the first time. It took me like five minutes to make sure I didn't tear it. Um, and, but so when you actually, uh, for those out in podcast land, I'm holding what is basically like a, a, like a deck of cards box, but here's the cards, but the box itself completely opens out all the way and has all of the instructions you need to run the game just printed on the box and all the different faces of the box which is really, really cool and super well done. Um, so mythos Very types, cool. story start, story end, play around, interpreting, phase change, alternate rules, setup, a review, all of it. Really, really cool. And one of the things I really loved about this project too was the digital version isn't just like a PDF of all the cards. They actually were um, creating a, um, or uploading it to playingcards.io. Um, so you can actually play the, play the game digitally as if, as if playing it in real life and it's loaded in there already so that you can just do that, which is great in a, you know, uh, still ongoing pandemic, despite what people are acting like. Um, so <laughs> super fun project. I was really excited to get it, really excited to try this. Um, it'd be fun playing it in front of this bookshelf since it would be game mechanics and let's make a story yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so fun, um, fun project. Really excited to get this. Um, it didn't end yeah. that long ago. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that's cool. The turnaround time um, on that was really quick. Yeah, I think it ended, um, oh God, let's I'm gonna check see. it out right now. Uh, t -t 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 it was last updated April 7th. I don't know when it ended though. If you go back to the beginning of the updates, it always says like, it was funded on this day, February 15th. So not bad at that's all. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Since it's not even April 15th, not less than two months. Great turnaround. Yeah, yeah. What else did Adam Bell do previously that I know? I know you previously backed something from him. I don't yeah, remember if I see. had. Um, it looks like four created. There was oh, uh, grasping nettles. No they, stone they turned. No, no stone turns. Do I have? I have no stone turns. I haven't played it yet. But I have it. So yeah, I definitely follow them on Kickstarter right now and and through their uh, other stuff just to make sure. Um, okay, so that's our physical rewards. Did you want to, do you have a, you don't have a project this morning, do you? I don't, no, this is a, uh, a Ryan heavy Kickstarter podcast, which is cool because I can read this through the book because I, uh, I, I'm a fanboy of the book. So take it away, baby, it's all you. All right, so we have, um, da, 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 da. I'll close that out. Two <laughs> things, I'll talk about this one first. Um, and then we'll talk about a big one that we're both very excited for. This is called, uh, the next one we're talking about is called The Ruinous Palace of the Metagorgos. It is an RPG adventure for Troika put out from um, Daniel Sell, who runs the Malsonian Arts Council, who creates Troika. So this will be an official Troika adventure. Um, and we've talked about Troika. Uh, we have two episodes on this. This is before uh, Hunter joined the podcast. Uh, it, it's, I, I mean, it is the best laid out book I probably will ever see. It is the epitome and everything that I judge the layout of all books on, um, especially as far as its functionality. Um, but as a game, uh, 
it's base stuff is kind of gonzo in a way that like i'm down for but it's not my favorite and i think it's way more of like yeah. Uh, a you yeah yeah it's more of a so, me thing yeah but this one describes itself as a weird sad rpg adventure for troika and bnx and i was like ah i found the one i'm gonna play um so it says uh <laughs> Swollen, ever pregnant with memory, Metagorgos waddles about the dark, wet ruination of her ancient home. Long forgotten, she has not been allowed to forget. Again and again, she births wretched reminders of her tragic past. Uh, untold ages has cursed the queen, suffered... Has the cursed queen suffered for the most cardinal of sin? She dared to make herself powerful <clears throat> and better the world around her. Such slights the awful gods do not forgive um yeah so this Ooh. is Ooh. Yeah, yeah 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 it does it is mature not adolescent themes motherhood birth mild bodily horror offering a fresh tone to the ongoing campaigns uh yeah oh super wait. excited sorry only mild body horror uh that's not enough i oh, know we got to get some severe body horror I the art looks really neat. severe body horror yeah. <laughs> uh the art looks pretty cool it's got this, a very very um specific color scheme it's black white and this kind of like burnt orange color little bit uh i would call it almost university of texas more than university of tennessee if you know what i'm saying um and uh it looks really cool um obviously it is most Indian art council um it is at fourteen thousand out of a six thousand dollar goal so we're in the stretch goals of it um so we're at free patches there's almost at fifteen thousand euros no pounds it's free pens um and at twenty thousand you get a free warm feeling inside oh really yeah. yeah 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 nice um and that's basically just extra money so they can keep doing other stuff so really cool art there's this really cool piece on here with gosh it oh, i don't even know how to describe some of what's happening it's a creature <laughs> with like blades slash bird looking things coming out with claw it's fingers very and maybe it's vagina very faces art you know yeah like... hardcore yeah um so yeah looks super cool the art looks really cool um it is official troika fair from Melsonian Art Council. Uh, it only has about 10 days left. Um, and again, uh, the ruinous palace of the Metagorgos, definitely more up my alley for Troika stuff than something like Franz of Benevolence. So really excited if, to actually get this. I backed yeah, the cover this, so stoked for that. If you like haven't played Troika yet and you're like wondering for an entry point, maybe you even have it, like this is a great time to hop on because you know, for what, 20, a 38 American dollars, 29 pounds, you can get this and uh, the act and Troika. Um, so if you like, yeah. you know, don't have Troika, but you kind of are interested, um, this is a great way to, for, you know, 30 bucks instead of 38 yeah. bucks, get a new book with it as well. Um, uh -oh. yeah, so and in addition sick. to that, in addition to that, I think it's still going on, but Troika, Melsonian Art Council just dropped a 50% off everything sale on their website. So uh, another thing, if you don't have Troika or the starter bundle, it's a really good time because I think the full starter bundle is like 70 bucks. And if you can get that whole thing for 35 plus shipping, uh, that's insane. So definitely check that out. I'm um, going to check Troika out in general. Again, really great game. Super excited to really dig deep and play it. Um, it just, again, we've talked about this before. Our, our Venn diagram is probably like 80% overlapping. And this is the part that's either more towards you or in your little section um, as yeah. opposed to you know, like my end, which is like more Merc Borgy stuff. Um, yeah. And speaking of Merc Borgy stuff, uh, one of the projects that I'm super, super fucking excited for, um, we are talking about Soul Burner. Soul Burn. Adam Vass and World Champ Games. I mean, it's the reason I'm rocking my World Champ shirt today. Exactly, I don't know if that's why you're that's rocking your yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this cool. is we're, a, talk, we're definitely talking about Soulburn today. So. Oh, we absolutely are fucking talking about Soulburn, and we'll probably bring it up again next week because it'll still be here. But Soulburner is a scorched post-death exploration, a standalone bridge between Merkborg and Necronautilus, the two Dang. highest rated games that we've reviewed on this show are Merkborg and Necronautilus. So I think at this point, Merkborg is a 44, Necronautilus is a 43, and Death in Space is a 42 um, overall scores. So, uh, so yeah, really excited for this. Um, Soul Burner is a standalone tabletop role-playing game for two to six players, combining the death metal, dark fantasy flavor and mechanics of Merkborg with the themes of death, compulsion, and faulty memory from the stone or metal science fantasy game Necronautilus. In it, heaps of fresh ash and ember gain humanoid form in search of truth and revenge, discovering who they were and who they want to be along their violent way with your creativity and brutality at the helm. 
gosh, so excited for this. Published by yeah. Adam Bass World Champ Games, illustrated by Matt Oberski in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I mean, so fucking pumped for this. For any of you guys that saw Cyber Metal 2012, that was over on GameFound. Um, this one is back on Kickstarter. Uh, it's a $2,500 funding goal. It's right now at 6331 with 166 backers and 12 days to go. We got to bump that number up because this game looks sick as fuck. As does, I mean, we're obviously huge fucking out of vast stands here. We've said this over and over again. This is an out of vast stand <laughs> podcast. We have um, said it a lot. So, yeah, over well, one day we will get up the courage to ask out of vast to come on to the show and actually have a good conversation with them. That'd be. That'll be super fun. But for those I can see behind me, that, that's that's my dope custom uh, Eye Wizard Necro Nautilus Zine Box. And right here, just out of frame, is another uh, Zine Box from the Eye Wizard. It's got this logo on it. Huge, huge fans. I think I have... There might be one or two things in his entire catalog that I don't have. But otherwise, I have like 99% of everything Adam Vass has ever created. Um, we definitely need to just do like a short Adam Vass, like day where we just go through like the zines that are like you know four to eight pages just plug through those um, yes but anyway so what's inside soul burner uh, it's new complete core mechanics um there's ash which is a unique player class for the once dead uh there is a gallery of conflagrating creatures collections of memories and moments to jumpstart your creativity um just a whole whole bunch of stuff um, that we're very very excited for um, your body is composed of reminders, limbs and appendages formed from intense memories, both from your waking life before burning and your bloody adventures in the afterlife. I mean, this is just a perfect combination of like, like the dark fucked up fun stuff and Adam Vass's like, um, I can't remember the phrase that he uses, but it's like the, not, not just emergent storytelling, but, uh, feelings games. Yeah. Where like you you put a lot into it, and you if you let yourself can feel a feel a whole lot while you're playing the game, um, and really uh, dig a lot deeper than just rolling dice. And that's one of the things that I think both of us really really love about totally. um, about oh, their yeah. style of games. Yeah. I mean, listen, so, Adam Bass wants you to be sad, y'all. Yeah. They really well, I mean, they really want you to be sad. So be sad. You, it's a, it's a, if, yeah. <laughs> if you're not, if you look at the world and you're not sad right now. <laughs> there's something wrong with you um That's fair. but sometimes it's good to it's good to work through the sad you know when you're really sad and down sometimes the best thing you can do is put on the most depressing music you can find and stay in the dark <laughs> and listen to it um and i'm totally good with that uh very excited for that um as part of the uh the game um you can get the da, 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 you can get the pdf for 13 dollars uh, you can get the book soft cover edition for twenty seven dollars, um, and I don't know if there are add ons. I thought maybe there were. Yeah, there are add ons when you click on the. Um, uh, da, 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 da. You can add on an additional soul burner book, or you can add on Necronautilus. So if you don't have Necronautilus already, uh, add it to your fucking bookshelf. Get it through this, um, and back the fuck out of soul burner. Yeah, if you have Necronautilus and you've been listening to our show, like you should get Necronautilus. Like it is by far and away. Uh, is it? Wait, did you say it was the highest rated game we have, or is, is Merc? Oh, uh, it's second highest behind Merkborg. Um, okay. Uh, part of that is because Merkborg got a ten on value because there's a million fucking adventures and yeah, digital parts to it. But yeah. um, uh, it is the only game that got a ten on our originality score. Um, it's got bumped up to like a nine on game mechanics. I mean, the art in it's fantastic. Uh, if you take the value score off, I think um, Necro and Lawless would be the highest rated as far as like game mechanics and layout and stuff like that. I think it, that it, makes would, sense. it, would, it would trump Mark Borg by like maybe like two or three points. Um, so easily one of my favorite games I've ever read. Easily um, Adam Bass is easily one of my favorite creators of all time. So long story short, as we ramble on here, back this fucking game. It's called Soul Burner. Give Adam Bass money. Do it. Do it now. Um, and that's about all I have for, uh, for Kickstart the Podcast. It was a short one this Kickstart morning. Kickstart the Podcast. Um, I'm trying to save a little bit of money, so maybe in the future we won't even have some of those, or we'll start looking more, uh, not more, but, like, start, you know, grabbing some, like, small itch projects or something like that to go check out, because there's a couple that have dropped recently that are neat, but we'll think about doing that next week. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm running out as well. I really only have the two that we talked about on my uh, active pledges. Everything else is done. 
So yeah, this is all I got. I got the two that I talked about last week and, and uh, these two, and that's all I got active right now. Uh, there's one or two other that I, I was really looking at. Um, but again, I'm trying to save a little bit of money. Um, and you know, and we don't there's always a lot have of to... stock art on Kickstarter right now. There's a lot of, I've been going through projects oh, and I'm like, yeah. oh, look at this art that I've seen a bunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, people are putting out great projects and stock art still gets art done, you know? So. That's very true. Yeah. Um, are you ready to kick into overall? No, absolutely not, bro. I got I to gotta leave. I'm out of time. All right. Well, that's it for the podcast, no, guys. I want all of you to well. have a great day. Um, Fuck y'all. See you later. Okay, I'm ready. So, Overarms. Uh, here we go. Overarms is from Corey Burns, also known uh, uh, who runs Ricky Jet, Ricky Jet Studio. Again, we've already talked about uh, Red Giant, which we fucking loved. Um, and even when going through Red Giant, there was a bit of like an anime vibe to it. I know it was supposed to be like more berserk oh, and stuff like that. Super anime. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, definitely uh, yeah, yeah, channeled. Yeah, what, yeah. what did I say? It channeled really hard for me. Castlevania, not Castlevania. Um, Vampire Hunter D. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I'm and berserk that. and stuff. So, yeah. You have to watch the 2008 one, man. Bloodlust is like, oh, oh, you can get on YouTube. Um. Anyway, so a lot Why of the same was people. Why was Vampire hunting the D? Because they just like the D, man. He literally has a right hand that talks to him. Probably oh. probably doesn't... Anyway. So, Sorry. Overarms <laughs> is a tabletop role-playing game designed for people familiar with JoJo, Persona, Fate, Shaman King, and it aims to recreate the themes, mechanics, and powers seen in these kind of media. Overarms is very adaptable and can be used in a myriad of ways to suit your tabletop as a core of the system allows you to create your own abilities while using two entities as one character. I really like that. It's super dope. Um... Uh, they do the same thing in this one, maybe more to an extent. I don't remember in Red Giant where they um, basically like, what is a tabletop role playing game? Which is fine. Um, yeah. My only my only critique on this kind of section, uh, time spent and and pages worth, is this is probably not going to be your very first tabletop role playing game. So there's just a lot of pages dedicated to like tabletop I don't role know, playing. You know? I'd like Maybe. I have a I have a I have a brand newbie friend who's not super into the idea of D and D and I was like, Oh, I have a game that's like JoJo and they were like, Oh, really? And I was like, Yeah, it's like yeah. a proxy it's like a proxy fighter essentially, right? Like Persona or JoJo or Fate or Shaman or Shaman King. Um but well, yeah. then, hey, there you go. But um we well, I think I blew past it real quick, but one thing I noticed right off the bat, uh my fucking hyperlink kids. Oh yeah, have, it's hyperlinked. Even like the chapter have, like uh, starts are hyperlinked. You know, it's so good. Yep, uh, it is not bookmarked, so we'll see if there are page reference links later as well. Um, hmm. But but yeah, so there is a long section here um, with art and everything. Uh, it covers one. Oh, I guess it's not really that long. It's like a page and a half. I need to shut the fuck up. But it talks about what is a tabletop role playing game, what is a game, and all that kind of stuff, which is fine. Um, and then we get into uh, about anima and users. Uh, the world of Overarms has supernatural power that people and other living creatures can draw upon called anima, deities, guardian angels, ghosts, etc. We've all heard of these phenomena before. Basically, um, an anima is a psychic manifestation of your inner power that presents as some type of mostly humanoid being a manifestation of um spirit and life force so you basically get like a um you get a, a persona you get a, you get a like just, yeah you know yeah is that it's what a, persona a, is that is that what yeah. persona is like i know literally literally oh, zero oh, about persona actually this um because of some of the stuff we'll go through later on like like the enemy kind of zones that they have it's very very like persona um, should have at I least looked also, up persona i love persona bro um okay. but yeah like um yeah you have like this you know psychic spirit but i mean you could define it in a lot of different ways you know um and i think this is really cool so yeah but basically there's two of you is what it comes down to because the whole point the whole um the way the game works is there's you there's your buddy and you can do things or you can do things with your your psychic your psychic pal um yeah. And you are the user, they are the animal, and you have a bond. Um, and that is the basics of the entire thing. Um, yeah. Do you? Yes. Do you want to? Yeah. 
So, um, what's really cool about this game is it really wa- it, it really treats it like an anime, and it walks through several parts. And one of the first is like the awakening of your power. Like, how do you figure out what your power is? Um, and yeah, so uh, when a user discovers their anime, though, uh, they usually do not know anything about it. Um, and that's thing to figure out it's uh, what the power is. Uh, sometimes the ability is straightforward and easy to understand, um, and sometimes it's not, right? So an anima user will need to practice, develop their anima's potential, and use it more in a precise manner. Excuse me. Um, hidden subtleties um, and applications of the anima's, po- anima's power may require time for the user to notice. Um, to use an anima, the user has to consciously summon it. Um, so, uh, likewise, for the anima to do anything, the user has to consciously um, command it. Uh, it's weird because like the anima, like it says that was a bond, but it's distinctly not another entity. Um, it is distinctly an extension of yourself. Um, but you're bonded to it, you know? You gotta bond with uh, yourself, bro. Yeah, and so the awakening is a lot is very much a section for like how to step your game. It's a lot of stuff we're gonna go through today is like story ideas and very optional, but this is great for you, like the beginning of your adventure, your coming of age Japanese school game where you have your kids who like awaken to their abilities. And yeah, um, you're either that's one thing. Pe- people are that's either one thing I with, with it and then yeah, whatever, go for it. Sorry, that's well, one, one thing you said, that's one thing I noticed with the rookie jet when we were doing um, uh, Red Giant is it's a lot of uh, seeds as yeah. opposed to specifics. Yeah. Um, which is fine. I just noticed with, uh, Corey Burns, the way that he writes, that's what he likes to do a lot is instead of giving you like, uh, a, 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 here's a list. It's more like, here's some, like uh, some broad stuff, build your own. Um, and I love that. I, I've, I have written out, um, I actually did not read, there's an adventure already written this and I still have not read it, but it is a high school adventure, which is funny. Cause my first thing was like, I'm going to write a fucking high school, Japanese high school adventure, bro. And it's exactly what I did. Um, so some vocabulary player, that's a player. Um, user is someone who can control an anima. So your char- your player characters are users. You have a game master, player character, non-player character. Um, the party, uh, a session, which is, you know, a single game. A scenario, which can be multiple sessions. Uh, a campaign, which uh, can be a lot longer. Dice, die, a uh, pool. Um, a pool in overarms is, like, is a group of dice. It's a pool of dice. Um, and then a check is a thing that you roll dice to figure out whether or not you pass. Um, pass there. We have a junction. Uh, a junction is when you utilize a stat from both your character and anima to determine the uh, outcome of a scenario. And we kind of saw this before in Red Giant, where you took two stats and you rolled them together. Um, so, for example, uh, strength, which is the human stat, plus power, which is the anima stat. Uh, is considered a junction because it involves, yeah, um, yeah, that. Uh, critical, uh, we all know what crits are. Um, since this is like a two dice system, um, when all dice rolled during a check show sixes or both dice roll uh, the highest possible value, i.e. if you roll a D4 and a D8, they get, you get an eight and a four, um, that's a critical, and it's a spectacular success. A fumble is performed when dice uh, show their lowest possible value. Um, that's a fumble. Uh, fumble is always a terrible result. Anima is like we talked about the manifestation of your power. Um, ability. Animas have unique powers that they can use. Um, hit points are hit points. Anima points are uh, AP. Is uh, it, it dictates like what your anima can do. It's like the, the stock of its actions essentially or its ability uses before suffering fatigue. Uh, fatigue is like a negative uh, uh, condition that you can get from like, running out of uh, HP or AP. Um, an animus is a counterpart to an anima. This is a type of being that operates by their own set of rules and has no users and primarily dwells in the mirage. Uh, the mirage is a like a gap in between worlds. If you have played Persona or watched the Persona animes, it's that like psychic realm that they go into to fight the other Persona users or to fight their evil Personas. Um, yeah, very cool. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like, you like see, you said. Have you seen Persona either? Bro, get on yeah, it. Man, I, all I've heard, I've heard Persona 5. Is that a video game or something? All I hear uh, is. Yes, so there's like a bunch of Personas uh, video games, and there's like 
five mainline and uh, three, four, and five all have offshoot games. And I think maybe the early ones do as well, but I haven't watched them. And then there's a whole other series of games. There's a super Japanese name that I can't think of the top of my head that inspired kind of the persona, but it's another like proxy fighter kind of thing. But yeah, uh, there's also animes, like actual anime that goes with it. It's great. You should you should check it out. Persona 5 is a fantastic game. So I'll have to check it out. And like you said, at the beginning of each chapter, each chapter has like another like table of contents for within that chapter, which is really, yeah. really nice. And, and it is hyperlinked click. as well. Yeah, it's yeah, fucking cool. Which is dope. Very organized. Yeah, they did a good job with this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's uh, the Emmanuel Galledo. Is that uh, Rooster Emma? Uh, Rooster Emma, yeah, yeah, yeah. They did, yeah, they're yeah. the one that also did uh, all the layout and stuff for Red Giant, which is yeah. which is oh so good. And this is a really like as we go through, it's like it's a very clean game. Like it's it's like it definitely conveys with these colors that it's kind of like this upbeat, like super anime. Um, nice. And I like it. It's bright and shiny. Um, so character creation, and as we said, like on the last episode, I love when character creation comes first early in the book, um, and second has steps, so I can just look and like okay, cool, I know there's five steps. So there are five steps. There is stat generation, uh, vices, virtues, and drive, um, background and history, uh, appearance, and money and social status. Because this is like a you know potentially social anime game, and so you'll have to interact with people. And I like that. Um, so stat generation, player characters' uh, stats in overarms are determined by selecting a D4 a D6, a D8, a D10, and a D12 die for your pool. Um, beginning by taking the highest value die from the pool and write down, essentially each stat is, a tr is attributed to a certain die. And that's it. Um, whenever you use that stat, you are going to roll that die. Um, let's see. Example, strength is the most desired stat for a certain character. So I want it to be the highest. So it's going to be a D12. Um, and strength, and then the D10 in the second paper. Yeah, you guys understand. Um, there are five stats. There is Charisma, Cha, um, which is Charisma. Um, there is Dex, Int, Strength, and HP. Um, HP is a special stat and is never used for a check, but whatever die value you place here becomes doubled. So just whatever, if you put a D4 into your, uh, into your HP, you have eight HP. Uh, nice and simple. Yeah. That's the other thing I like about the system is like honestly, it's so it is so simple. It's so like, simple. Like it is, it is, it's 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 a rules light TTRPG, and it really is. Like it it's really super light. is so light. Um, like it's definitely lighter I, than Red Giant, which is already a relatively yeah. light game. And yeah. ninety percent of what we go through in this game is just going to be like story hooks um like seeds like we were talking about and like even bits and pieces like the mirage will go over like i'm concerned not using it you don't even really need to use it you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah there's nothing in here you, yeah um very I would good say, I would say, game. i would say even just like character creation and animal creation just even like the setup stuff which is really easy is exponentially longer than actually like the combat rules or any of the other encounter yeah. rules in the game which is like a relatively short section but like still like when we get to it still conveys exactly what they're going for. And it's not like you're missing out on anything. You just don't need that much. Yeah, you really so. don't. Um, and I really like it. I think it's done really well. Um, yeah. yeah, so we are on to vices and virt or virtues, vices, and drive. Um, <laughs> so these are three aspects of your character that pretty much just help you flesh out what your 16-year-old uh, you know, superpowered anime protagonist is about. Um, virtue is a very positive trait, something your character holds in high moral regard. Uh, vice is a flaw uh, or corrupt aspect of the character, uh, i.e. your character is a kleptomaniac and has to steal something from every store they go into. Uh, drive um, is what pushes your character you know, towards their goal. Um, so, you know, three pillars that they're fairly common, I think, in t tabletop games where we see these, these three, uh, but they're good for setting up and fleshing out a character. Um, background and history is our next one. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, pretty much everyone has a background in history. Um, and so it's just to have you flush it out here. You know, what is your character's goal? You know, who or what had the greatest impact on their life? Um, the death of their parents, you know, their grandfather in the hospital. What's some other anime trope? Um, Gosh, uh, I think you just named like 90% of them. 
Let's see. Uh, they're from a, a, a really fundamentalist rich family, but uh, left and got kicked out. Um, <laughs> you know, pick, pick one. Uh, um, uh, what does uh, my character need most? Uh, how would others describe a char- my character? I kind of like that one. Like, how do other people feel about your character? Not just how does your feel- character feel about themselves? Uh, when and why did my character gain an anima? Um, and that's great too, because you might you might not start your your player characters with animas, because mine aren't starting yeah. with animas. They're gonna earn that shit. Um, yeah, and other background and history ideas, basically just story stuff to lay out who your character is. Um, and I, I think this is a you know we kind of not always go back and forth. I think Ryan and I maybe outside of this go back and forth with like we like really super dungeon crawly games, and like you know there's not a lot of background in story. Like sometimes you're just playing your wizard. And then that wizard dies, and then you're wizard too. Yeah. But it's fun to play a game like this, and then like, no, there's not that many rules. Lay out your background. This is very much about the the story social aspect. Uh, well, one thing I do like about this section too is I, we've talked about this, and it, it's a hard, it's a hard, um, it's a hard line sometimes. Not that it, it, the line itself is hard, but it's hard to like find the line between um, like I love the fucking roll tables, right? But like sometimes yeah. if you have a roll table, people will feel that like they have to roll on that table or only pick one of the things from that table. So if each one of these had a D6, you're going to get a lot of kind of redundancy if you play this a bunch of times because people will feel obligated to kind of pick yeah. one of those six or their brain just kind of shuts down with that, like, you can do anything you want, but here's six options. The easiest thing is to pick one of those six <laughs> options. So I like that there's no real, like, list for the virtue, vice, and drive. You're just supposed to make that up. And yeah. I, again, like that the background in history doesn't have, like, a list of answers. It is just a list of questions to get you thinking. And I really like yeah. that a lot better than just, it could be this, 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 or this. So, you, like you just said, you listed off, like, five tropes. Instead of just being, like, those five or six tropes, here's literally, like, fuck, like, 15 questions, something like that. Some, like, huge number of questions to get you thinking. And I, I really like that a lot better, especially in, in this sense. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a super big, you know... I know that they sent us like an at cost uh, copy of this game so we could review it, and, but we are not going easy on it because they did that. Um, I just really like this game. Um, I really yeah. like Rookie Jet, Rookie Jet stuff. I think it accomplishes like both this and Red Giant really accomplish what they're trying to do. Um, and I yeah. fucking love the idea of a fucking high school Persona JoJo adventure so much. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, appearance, obviously. Um, the appearance of this, we're still in character, we're not in anime yet. So the appearance of your character is fairly important, who they are, kind of where they are in life. Um, yeah, players are recommended to pull inspiration from the setting and year in which the campaign is set for fashion advice. So if you're a high school student, you should look like a fucking high school student, right? Uh, if you're in a cyberpunk future game, your character should look like they're in a cyberpunk uh, future game. Uh, so this is kind of a thing for everyone. Make sure that you guys have an open discussion at your at your table before the game starts because you don't want to start your high school adventure and one of them be uh, a knight in armor because uh, that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, money and social status. Uh, when playing over arms, it's important to decide uh, how you want to handle character income. Income will be used to determine your social status, uh, what items slash relics you can purchase. Um, in some ways, even what the way NPCs or your fellow party will treat you when you're playing. I'm earning an income uh, because there's, there's a lot of potential for like a, a coming of age slice of life um, anime. And this totally makes sense that they have an earning your income section. Um, yeah. So determine how your character uh, earns their income. Uh, uh, when or earnings or when earning an income, uh, the character is effectively removed from the party for the time being, unless in a special circumstance where other characters are present at their place of work. Um, each day is equivalent to six hours work. Players are expected to uh, relay the details of how they earned their income. Where do you work? Was it a good shift? Did you steal this money? Do you like who you worked with? Um, yeah, very cool. You know, you can have an episode where it's just like you got to go find a job today, you know? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and just a reminder on appearance, um, high school d d uh, high School of the Dead and Prison School are all animes, so you just you go nuts. Is all oh I'm my saying. god! <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't do that. Um, yeah, so passive income. Certain characters may not have a standard income, such as students, 
uh, special agents, millionaires, etc. These characters are able to earn a passive income that does not require working uh, away from the party in most cases. Um, because of this example, uh, so choose one so social status: poverty, which is 10 G per day. Uh, middle class, which is 20 G per day, and then rich, which is 40 G per day. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think for me personally, like this is one of those instances where I might create a custom roll table for people um, to roll for their, like, whether or not you're a student. Like, are you a student of a wealthy family? Are you a student that ha of a middle class family? Do you, does your family need you to get a job? You know? Well, even if you just roll a D3, I mean, it, or, or, you know, D6 and, and do whatever with it. Just for those three things right there, poverty, middle class, rich, and then just do everything else after that, then yeah. you build your character in a completely different way because that affects your background, that affects your virtues and vices, that can affect everything just to know whether you come up in poverty, middle class, or, or rich, back, rich, you know, rich amount of income. Very fair. So you could almost do income first and just do a character after that. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, alternatives to earning money. Um, yeah, there are other things you can do in this game other than working a job. For example, uh, you can also earn money by defeating enemies in combat, uh, selling items and relics you no longer need, or finding travel or treasure as you travel through the mirage. Um, I really like that. I like really would love to lean. I I will lean into the video game anime aesthetic of this and like yeah, you beat up an enemy and it fucking drops like five G. You know like. Absolutely. Turns into bro. a diamond. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. I don't give a fuck. Let's see. Give me rupees. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you smash the, the pot um, that you found in the hallway and it has a green rupee in it. Um, yeah. But uh, below are some examples of monetary rewards based on the difficulty of a situation, um, whether it be an enemy um, or if you're like try selling something. So yeah, there you go. Easy 4G. You know, a little difficult six, difficult eight. And all oh. the way down to Miracle 40. Um, as a GM, you should keep in mind not to overload your player characters with money or give them access to every item or relic at a time. Um, Two things. Uh, I thought you Two. said easy orgy. And I was like, <laughs> wait, what? What are we easy defeating orgy, here? Baby. Yeah. Um, and second, I love that uh, defeating a mirac like a miracle level situation. Like in like beyond impossible a miracle <laughs> level situation okay it's the same as just being rich for a day yeah you bet yeah, yeah absolutely that's, it's i mean that, in, that is <laughs> it's, it's i mean i'm not being sarcastic that's how the world works it's gotta be it nice. is man oh spoiled fucking dicks <laughs> Um, cool. Anyway. And now we're on to anima creation. So your anima, yeah. your your but proxy a, that fights. Oh, 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 oh. Fucking dope piece of art above that. Definitely gives you that like high school kind of like high school troublemaker. You know, troublemaker. This got way too much power. Like fucking. Um, uh, you just get your meshy oh, baby. Yeah. Or uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, fuck. Why am I blanking on Bleach? Ichigo, like before yeah. he actually got his fucking Soul Reaper power. His like hands are all bandaged <laughs> up, and he's all like sad, sitting down with like a backpack and his like lanyard with the student ID on it. Obviously, has yeah. that like bad attitude face. This this game isn't like necessarily flushed with art. There is art in it, but all the art in it is pretty severely cool. Um, yeah. Like the oh, next yeah. piece we're gonna see too, I think, is in one of my top three. Um, the, the, the guy with the crown on his head, I don't know why is my favorite one. We'll get to it, but this next one's oh. really cool as well. An anima creation. Yeah. So yeah, your anima, your, 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 you know, your psychic spirit that fights for you, the persona that you've conquered and now summon into battle for you, whatever it is in your game. And it could be a lot of stuff. The ghost that you bonded with to do combat in your shaman like, battle royale game or whatever um yeah so uh the animus uh generation has uh creation has just four steps right we have status generation um anima type um ability and appearance and they work exactly the same way so four stat generation oh, let's go down to the explodey guy explodey guy's cool great piece of art again For those watching, uh, it's a dude in a blue hoodie, eyes closed, like arms like extended. He's got this very like kind of expression of bliss on on his face. 
but in the background is literally just like a giant fucking like energy or like fireball going off with like a lightning racing across it like the 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 epitome of like walking away like slow motion <laughs> from from an explosion so very zen yeah. he's also got like his mood rose, you know he's got his like finger and thumb touching reaching out like he's like summoning go. the void uh okay yeah so Anima stat generation, this is the exact same thing, right? So we have a selection of dice. We have the, the D4, D6, D8, D10, and D12 that we'll assign to these stats. Um, you have power, um, which is like strength. They're, they're very one-to-one. -one. So it's power instead of strength. It's speed instead of dex. It's defense instead of whatever else I said. And it's range instead of whatever else I said. <laughs> so... Um, Power and speed make a lot of sense, right? Their power and speed. Uh, defense is how durable. Uh, range is determined how far your animus abilities can reach. Um, the range is equal to uh, thrice the size of the die. For example, if you put a D4 in there, there's a range of 12 meters. We're using meters, y'all. Um, so you can't set your game in the US. Um, and then AP. Um, AP, your anima points, represents how many times your animas your, your anima, uh, how many times you can, I'm oh, sorry, you can use your anima before they suffer from fatigue. AP, once again, like HP, is a special stat. Um, it's never used for check. Checks, whatever die you place here, it becomes doubled. So if you put a D4 in there, you have eight AP. Um, yeah. Um, anima types. So uh, your, your combat buggy, uh, there are several different types of anima, and it kind of changes what role they take in um the party both in and a little bit out of con uh, combat because it's kind of dictate what abilities you choose for them right so we have fighter magician guardian and assassin um so fighter uh this type is best fit for an anima with high power uh but low range because they're going to be brawling they're up close and personal um abilities which we'll get to in a second are suited to be damage based although i could think about a thousand fire abilities that wouldn't be damage based um accuracy is going to be for hitting will be uh strength plus power minus one uh that's your character strength your anima power minus one and then damage is strength power plus one um magician uh which is going to be your high range but maybe low power output of uh, ac uh, accuracy is int and range minus two Damage is int and range plus two. Um, Guardian, which is going to be high defense, maybe low speed. The high defense, definitely. You have a strength and defense plus two for accuracy. And then damage is strength and defense minus two. Um, and then Assassin, your sneaky boy, your high speed boy, um, is going to be accuracy. Uh, to hit is uh, dex plus speed. And then damage is dex plus speed minus one. Did we touch on the accuracy at one point in time? I'm blanking a little bit. Like, um, I don't, accuracy is well that'll be in the combat section um okay. again which is why i like to have like a brief overview of some of the rules before character creation we've talked about yeah, this many times. that's fair yeah yeah we yeah. go back and forth um okay so those are the basic uh the four types of animas um although you know frankly if my character player characters came to the table and said i want to do this instead and here's what the stats would look like it's very easy it's always one human stat one um anima stat then plus or minus flipped, right? right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. very easy to make your own. Um, anima abilities. So this is potentially uh, my favorite part of this, is that there is no real ability list for animas. They have some samples on here, but you can have your anima do whatever power you want to, but what you and the Game Master agree is a, is a relatively, like, okay, first-level power, um, and I think that really opens up the door because if you want to have like my, I, there's so many crazy fucking powers in Jojo Jojo's that if you want to recreate any of them, you absolutely could. Um, at the beginning, um, on level one, your anima starts with a single ability. Um, anima abilities can be used, uh, any time during the overarms, although there may be times where using the ability maybe more appropriate than others, but that's pretty straightforward, right? Like if you're casting a gigantic fireball is your ability and you use that, like when you're, you know, in the middle of an inter interrogation, it might not go well, you know? Yeah. Um, but like I said, and then it begins the game with one ability and learns two more as they level up throughout the, ca throughout the campaign progress. 
Um, the second and third alien abilities are typically a stronger or more flexible version of the original ability. So it's actually easier kind of to think of like, what is my anima's most powerful ability looks like if you have what we have it in mind and destructure that and make it more simple. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool. Some, some examples, um, ability to create and control magnetism, ability to see events that happened in the past, read minds, generate small storms, move through shadows, teleport to a place uh, in an image, um, create, manipulate acid, uh, become and turn uh, into two-dimensional objects, uh, crack locks and passwords. You know, you're there. There's kind of like a limitless thing. Like, you know, your anima could be like could turn into shadows as its first ability, like fade into shadow. And then for its max yeah. ability at three, all of your party for a short amount of time can all turn into a shadow or some shit. You know, like yeah. And there's so very, there's very so cool. yeah there's it's so broad. And like you said, I really like in this setting in this game and especially the way that Rookie Jet writes. I really like that it's not just like. Here is a list of abilities for all of the fighter types. Here's a list of ability for all of this. It's really super free form. Um, and again, I think that has its place. I think there's other games that would require more. Um, but for this one, just how like free and broad it is, um, I think it really, really fits. And I like these suggested ones. We've talked about it again too. It's one of the reasons I don't like moves in Powered by the Apocalypse games. Yeah. If you make if you make a list, people will feel like that's all they can do, as opposed to doing whatever they want and say, I want to do this. And then your referee says, sure, this is what you roll for it versus people looking at a list of things that they have and going, okay, these are the things I can do. How can I like make what I want to do fit this as opposed to it? And yeah. I think since your anima is literally like an extension of your psyche, like, or your characters, quote unquote, it's literally like, what the fuck do you want to do? Like, if you had this, what would you want to do? Or if yeah. your kid was like, yes. you know, yeah, like because everyone's first character is always just them. You know what I mean? Because that's how your Absolutely. brain works. Absolutely. Yeah, and then your fifth character is the exact opposite of you. Um, <laughs> and I do like I do like how it's like super, which means I need to not play Warlock sometime. Um, I do like how it's like super free, like you said. Um, and I think yeah, it says over and really over free. and over again in this game, like go watch a fucking anime and get some references. Yeah, like it says it over and over. What's your favorite There's anime? So do much it. to pull from. You know, it's just like yeah. a limitless. Like I have, I don't have the document pulled up, but I have my adventure written for this. Um, and I have a bunch of bad guys written up and all their animas written up. And it was a lot of fun to be like, oh, well, like, what does like this anima look like at level, at the, the third ability level, you know, which is very yeah. cool. Um, and actually, it's really great because right after this, we have um, a, like five, four um, example animas. You know, if you really want to look at what it would look like, we have four here. We have the last Baron, Steam Breather, Material Controller, and Night Owl. And I actually think it's one of each of the it is. Um, yeah, classes. Yeah, it's one of each. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. One of each classes. So you have your fighter, um, your guardian. Um, let's let's go through. Let's actually just look at the powers. Um, so Last Baron's our fighter type. And Last Baron's ability is the Last Baron can absorb heat and store it within its blade. Last Baron can also use this heated blade to damage targets from melt objects. Perfect. Fantastic, amazing ability. Um, steam Breather, which is our guardian, so our defensive class, uh, can create a veil of steam that can render the user invisible to others or to other users, any animus and any NPCs for 10 seconds for one combat round. Uh, the Assassin Material Controller uh, can swap the substances of any two inorganic objects it touches at the same time. What the fuck is that ability? You know? And like, this is exactly what I would want to see from my player characters. Some ability like that that's super, super utility. That I'm just like, oh, okay. And then they use it, and I'm like, oh, you're a genius. Um, because like that, like if you were trying to break down a door and get a piece of glass, you could switch the you could switch the glass from whatever the door is and then kick in the fucking glass door. You could even just um, turn the lock into fucking glass and yeah. then just break the fucking lock and go through. Dude, what the fuck yeah. is a really, it's a really clever ability that if yeah. you brought it to almost anybody, they'd be like, oh, that seems underpowered. But no, it's actually incredibly yeah. powerful. You could just have, um, I would just always keep something super soft and something super hard on me yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. And just be like swapping shit out constantly. I would have cotton balls in my pockets at all times, you know? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, I mean, you don't now. <laughs> And then Night Owl, which is our magician. Um, Night Owl can track other anima users by placing one of its feathers on the target. And that's another really sick story ability, you know? Oh, yeah. 
Um, some GM ability advice. Some abilities created in overarms can be game-breaking. When playing as, uh, as the GM, and I love when playing as the GM because you are playing the game. Um, you are another player. It is important that you work with your players on what kind of abilities are allowed and inform them how certain abilities can be too powerful for the campaign. Some abilities can also suck the fun of the game for other players, which totally seems very true. Um, it is important to consider this um, as well uh, when creating characters. Um, if you are currently playing a game as the GM where an ability has become obstructive or overpowered, you should let the player who controls that character know um, and try to work on like a reasonable solution or add like a monkey paw effect. Like, yeah, you use this, but then something bad happens, you know? Uh, or there's inherent downside to using the power. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, this is a good fucking game, bro. I, I really want to yeah. play this. Yeah. I definitely think this, like, it, this would be fun to play with people that have never played games before because you know the people that I, I'll straight up say, you know the people I can't fucking stand, especially in, you know, um, the world's power whatever gamers. role playing game. Yeah, yeah. Fucking power gamers. When you got someone who doesn't fucking pay attention, waits for their turn, and just like summons Tyrannosaurus Rex or some bullshit. Or yeah. like levitates like 50 fucking daggers. It's like, okay, we get it. You've played the game enough and you read all the fucking things to have the perfect spell, match the perfect spell. We get it. You're like, like you're not even playing the game at that point. You're literally just like, oh, I have this game breaking spell. Here you go. Thanks. So I win, right? Fuck off. Um, so I really <laughs> like someone who like hasn't played a bunch of games doesn't know all the tropes to be able to make up ability because they think yeah. that's fucking cool not because they yeah. think it's gonna win you know so that'd be i yeah. and i would be you know i think for me running this game there's not a lot i would say no to when it comes to abilities right. there's a lot i would let fly until it maybe it became a problem but even then i think that there's always no matter what the power is there's always a way to scale it down and achieve a very similar effect um so, well, the other I mean, thing you can always I mean, really do too interested. is if someone's if someone's got like a super overpowered ability and you just like throw stuff at them and they like instantly kill everything, you're like, "Is this fun for you? Are you having a good time? Let's yeah, do it again." Are they having then, fun? I don't fucking care. So, well, no, I care, but I think everyone at the table and no, then I mean, they, I, they. I mean, I don't care if someone's overpowered. Is what I mean. So. Oh, oh, oh! I'm saying like I can imagine basically being like you're overpowered. You know you are. You're trying to power game it. Here's some fodder. Like, is this fun? Is, like, this is what you think is fun? And everyone at the table is going to be like, this isn't fun. And it's like, okay, then let's, like, rework this power a little bit or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, but in, inversely, if I was like, okay, is this fun? And they were all like, oh, no, this is a blast. I would be like, okay, like, keep it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, keep it. I don't, yeah. I don't, I yeah. don't I yeah. not give yeah. a fuck, bro. Like, no. and also, if there's an ability that you feel like is game-breaking, it's not. Like, work around it, you know? You're, yeah, you're the GM. You're, you're the GM. Be more creative, you know? Yeah. Uh, Why don't you create an animus that has like an ability that like neutralizes their ability and then they can't do anything? <laughs> You're the yeah. GM. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. And that might be fun for them too because they get to, you know, overcome this, uh, you know, adversary. You? It's their perfect rival, you know? Yeah. And then um, they just get stronger. Yeah. And now we are on to uh, the game in of itself. Oh, and welcome back to the weekly scroll here on the Adventure Archive where we are hitting the actual rules section of open arms over arms over arms, <laughs> over arms. i'll just, welcome I'll just back. hello welcome to the welcome <laughs> back i'll just edit this out if i ever edited anything oh, I, I, no. I don't oh you get this raw okay. kids all right so, game uh raw and uncut baby the game the game let's talk about the fucking game y'all let's be playing some games y'all um game phases so um a game phase is like a scene um, or like a, a, a like a, mi a miniature part of whatever you're going through, right? Um, there are more or less um, four distinct scenes um, within overarms. We have the, uh, and they're all phases, uh, even though they're called scenes. Um, so we have a social phase, the investigation phase, combat phase, and conclusion phase. Uh, it's important to note that game phases can be used in any order um, that works. Except conclusion is probably going to come last because it's fucking conclusion. So if you put it first, you're an idiot. Uh, but you jump to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, huh? When huh? acting as the GM, um, make sure to announce uh, when a phase is ended and another begins so that all players are aware of that change uh, and know how to roleplay appropriately during the new phase. 
While it is possible to play over arms without using a uh, game phase structure, the structure may help players of all skill levels determine what they need to accomplish in uh, at the uh, given moment. Um, for more information, um, you know, regarding game phases, see the scenario, uh, scenarios, chapters in the book, which we're not going to read because we don't read the scenarios, so y'all. Buy the fucking book. Uh, yeah, so social phase. Um, the social phase is used for characters to speak with one, um, one another or NPCs they might know. Uh, during this time, characters can travel around asking about recent events, uh, formulate plans, attend school, uh, day jobs, or events. Uh, this phase encourages the characters to speak with those around them um, or advance the story by social means. Love that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, investigation. Um, inve uh, an investigation uh, phase is, is used when someone uh, has a little bit of I can speak. I can read today, guys. I know can words, you? okay? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm terrible. Investigation. An investigation phase is used when something has happened and the characters need to perform physical and mental actions in order to advance the story. During this time, characters can be encouraged to search the area, try to solve puzzles, or chase someone suspicious. Uh, this phase excuse me, uh, sets the stage for new information to be discovered or a point, uh, or, or a point to forward the plot. Um, cool. Yeah. Combat. Uh, combat is when people fight. There you go. Uh, conclusion. Uh, conclusion is a phase that's usually typically um, after a major revelation or when the session ends. Uh, during this phase, the GM is expected to narrate the event so far and allow players to give their own recap if needed. Uh, this phase allows players to know that they have hit a milestone or are moving into the next chapter, uncovered something important, or simply that it's time to call it a night. You got checks? You take over for checks for a little bit. I'm going to rest my, my poor voice. Thank you. All right. So checks, RPGs frequently include a random element to represent uncertainty, mystery, and the possibility of failure. That's where you get checks. So uh, they determine success and failure. The higher the stat, the better the chance of success. However, no matter how high, there's always a chance of failure. And that's how performance, that's how checks work in here. So we have another list. Um, performance check is a check made to see if the player character is able to complete a particular action. Um, and here is the process for doing that outlined one through seven. Number one, the player states the intent and approach of the character. Uh, number two, the GM states the type of check, the target number, and the stats that you must roll up. So we're going to get into it in a little bit. But one thing that uh, is common in Rookie Jet is using two different stats. Um, and when you do it in this game, um, it's called a junction when you use one of your character stats and one of your anima stats together. Um, you don't have to do that, but you always get um, the type of check and the target number. Uh, number three, if the player is acting in junction with their anima, I just said that, they spend one AP and now roll two stats, one for each of the, the people, even though it's you. Um, number four, the player rolls corresponding <laughs> dice, adds them together, and adds any bonuses from items, relics, or other sources. Number five, check for crits uh, or crit fumbles. Um, uh, otherwise, number six, if the total is equal to or higher than the um, target number, the check is a success. If lower, it's a fail. And seven, the GM describes the outcome. That's an easy, that's a, that's a, that's a long list of seven to say, say what you want to do. The GM tells you like what you have to roll, which stats to roll with, and the number you have to get above. You roll those dice. And if you get higher, you're good. If you get lower, you, you, you done, you done fucked up, kid. Um, so the list of target numbers um, difficulty, target number is basically your difficulty value. So four is easy, six is a little bit difficult, eight is difficult, 12 is very difficult, 16 is almost impossible, and 20 is a miracle. My question with that is, if you're just acting on your own without your anima in junction with you, you're just rolling one dice, right? Yeah, I mean, you're just a human at that point. So then this list, it would be... Like, if you only have, like, a D8 in the stat, I guess the highest you could possibly get is a D12, right? Because that's yeah. your highest potential score. Yeah. So that's... And then if you add in your animal, you could theoretically get up to Miracle. Okay, that makes sense. Because you could use yes. their D12 score. Right. So, all right. Uh, so it's not that far off. It's just, obviously, as a human, without your animal, you get... You, you can't do as difficult of task. Yeah, you're a human. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, crits... 
or critical hits, uh, they only occur during junctions. So you cannot crit on your own when you're acting as a human, because as we just said, you're just a human. You're a fucking human, um, yeah. <laughs> you're so just a, a 16-year-old in high school, man. Like, <laughs> Right? Yeah. So uh, when you're acting in junction, you roll two dice, and they either have to show two sixes or the highest of each one. So it's a d4 and a d8. You have to have a four and an eight. Or two sixes, period, um, which means you can't... Uh, no, you can crit because you can do four and an eight, but you couldn't do two sixes on like a d4 and something if, if those are the two stats that you were using. Um, critical always results in a success, spectacular success, and a fumble is when both values are the lowest possible on the dice. So it's it's two ones always because that's the lowest. So if you roll two ones in a junction, it's a terrible, terrible result for you. Um, here's a badass piece of art. I think, and I might be mistaken, that there was like a Kickstarter exclusive maybe piece of art. And I think this was the cover of that book. Um, it's a picture of a, oh. a guy kind of grasping their shirt, but he looks like he's like submerged in water up to like almost his nose. Um, this is a fun piece. And he's got like, ch like slash, 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 cross, like, like five, like slashed out on his Check, wrist like a bunch of times. Yeah. 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 Um, and then there are Czech examples here, which is cool. So, um, it's dex strength, uh, cha and int are your base things. So dex is cha. navigating an object, sneaking, uh, strength is pushing heavy stuff, cha or charisma is deceiving stuff, int is calculating a situation. But what's more, uh, interesting is the junctions. So you can use your anima to, let's just randomly, uh, oh. dex plus range is what you use to, uh, you use an ability to climb, jump, or move to areas normally inaccessible while using your anima. Like, I think uh, uh, the third one, cha and power, intimidate or taunt someone, you know? Like, I like, we've talked about it, and in 5e, like, you know, I've often let, especially barbarians, use power or their strength yeah. score for intimidation. Well, yeah, that why lets not? you do it all right there. If you walk yeah, up yeah. to me and you're fucking 300 pounds of muscle, yeah, you're going to intimidate me better. You know? But bro, you don't um, have good charisma. You can't intimidate people. <laughs> That's how Come it works. <laughs> yeah. I know that I every time like... I've been intimidated by a person, they're the most charismatic person in the room. So. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely <laughs> not the biggest, strongest, like glorious, <laughs> glorious person. Not at all. Um, but Dex, Dex is a good one. Protect someone physically from danger. You can just stab both your two Dexes. Because I think there was a question that we had during... Um, there was a question. Red Giant. Can, can you see, use the same set twice? Yeah. And they were like, he was and like, I think Absolutely. Ricky Joe was here at the time and was like, fuck yes, good job. Um, so, and it also says here at the bottom that these are, this is not a definitive list. Like, so don't, I would almost say like, read this through once to get a good idea and don't look at it again and don't have this list out when you're trying to decide what you want to do this is just a good reference for stuff and then i'll keep that list off to the side and you tell me what you want to do and i'll tell you what you want to do versus you sit and watch this list and be like okay i can only do the things on this list of 10 exactly like we said before don't give me a list of moves do what you want anything you want the whole world is your oyster and I'll tell you what what stats you need to roll for it. So um, I think it, I think it's done away. And I love the way that they do the two stats together, which is cool. Uh, yeah, do you want to take abilities I'm, or I'm going to keep going? I'll take abilities. I'm actually really excited for this game. I'm just going to kind of tangent for just a second because I am doing a high school game uh, and when their powers are awakening. So actually the way the game starts out is they don't have an anima. Like the player characters like outside of the game obviously know they're going to have an anima and I'll have to make it. But uh, they do have access to one of their anima stats um, that they can just use uh, once a day. Just once a day, like if they're like, and it help, I think it's going to help them shape like, oh, is my anima like a really fast person, a really like strong person? Am I using like, you know, dex range, to, like jump over stuff or whatever? Um, I'm excited to see how it goes though. So there's something like kind of like they get this boost, but they're not sure why yet. And it's going to help them yes, awaken. They're just like, yeah. Dope. Dope. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's yes. cool. And they get awakened by being attacked, just like every good anime. Um, exactly, of course. I do. I, I really, honestly, I have this one really plotted out very well. Um, and there's a lot of super anime moments in it. Um, Even those hollows. Yeah, using uh, abilities or being attacked by teachers. Uh, to uh, use your ability, uh, simply uh, think of what your anime would do. Um, relay that to the rest of your party uh, and make the appropriate roles according to what the GM says, essentially. You know, and this is kind of like, you know, what we all like about moving away from that one game uh, is that 
all other games kind of that we go over mostly are want to to explain what you're trying to do and then later on figure out what the dice roll is. Not I'm gonna roll perception. Uh, no, no, you know I'm gonna roll to convince this guy. No, just tell me what you just convince me and then we'll roll. Um, and if you make it good enough, you might not roll at all. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, when using your anima ability, it is important to keep a few things in mind. Um, others who have an anima can see your anima. Ooh, that's right. Um, sometimes people may even have an item that allows them to see your anima. Make sure to always be aware of the situation and use your ability uh, abilities accordingly. Um, keep track of your AP. When you run out of AP, uh, you put yourself at extreme disadvantage compared to your teammates or even the enemy. Be creative. Challenge yourself and your GM by using your abilities in the most unique way possible. Love it. Um, spending anima points. Um, abilities consume AP. Uh, the cost of each of these abilities is determined by which ability you're using. So the first ability you ever get costs one AP. Um, your second ability that you get costs two AP. And the third ability costs three AP. Um, following that logic, the third ability should be the power, most powerful, second should be second, and then your first one should be your most basic ability. Um, note that whenever you use your ability, or sorry, note that whenever using your ability involves a check, that check will automatically combine a stat from your character um, and one from your anima uh, without the need to spend further AP. So if you're spending the AP to activate the power and then you have to roll for it, there's no spending AP on that roll like you would um, in other circumstances. Uh, range. Anytime an ability is used or an anima attacks, you must consider its range stat to determine how close your anima must be in order to affect the target. Each point of range is considered to be three meters. This means an anima with a range of eight would have a range of 24 meters or roughly 78 feet, you know, because feet. Abilities during non-combat phases. When out of combat, your anima should still be a tool uh, you use to your advantage in everyday life. Animas may be great for fighting, but it's important to analyze your abilities and learn how to utilize those in creative and cunning ways in order to solve problems in your path. Um, here we have an example. Uh, first off, I fucking love this because I could totally see like scenarios where you have your character because I'm very much stuck in this like high school game mode because I've, I'm writing it, you know, but like you're at your job and you have to stack a bunch of boxes and you're like, oh, fuck, I only have a limited amount of time. It's like, well, I have a super fast anima and I'm going to activate that to like do it very quickly. I don't know. There's cool shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. My anima, Blue Drive Monster, great name, uh, Blue's Drive Monster, great name, uh, will use its ability of water manipulation to take water from the fountain in the town square and attempt to lift my character into the third story of the building. And maybe that's the art that we saw earlier. The guy with the water around him. Maybe, maybe. he's like activating his water control anima to lift him higher. Um, afterwards, it is up to the GM to set a target number and required stats to accomplish a task. The result of the check, um, yeah, and you, you pass or fail, right? If it's the ability, you, you don't need to spend any AP after the ability activation. Um, abilities during combat. When in combat, <coughs> anima and their abilities are typically forced are typically a force to be reckoned with, um, but this does not come without rules that need to be followed. Whenever using an ability to attack during combat, you need to spend an ability point um, based on which ability you're using, one, two, or three. Uh, then you make an accuracy check and, fo uh, and a following damage check if the accuracy check is successful. Uh, both checks will automatically combine a stat of your, you, we went over accuracy checks in the kind of like, it's two stats combined, um and determined by the anima type that you picked right if a character wants to target more than one enemy with their anima ability during combat they must subtract another anima point for each target so you don't have to roll multiple times but you do have to cost multiple points kind of a risk reward there because if you spend three points and you miss you fucking miss man you do. um yeah so combat um, combat has a flow. Like everything else kind of in this book, it's kind of set up at the very beginning. They go over their steps. Um, it gives you just a better like understanding of the whole thing. Um, combat begins because the party does something stupid or fails to get out of something or negotiate their way out, or you know, they get ambushed or whatever. Um, player uh, places their characters on the battlefield if you're using a grid. I'm not going to for this. Um, otherwise, they announce where the characters are 
you know, in the the you know imaginary theater of the mind room in your head. Uh, battle is divided into rounds. Um, determining initiative for each participant is uh, a battle uh, or in battle is a, a dex plus speed check. This does not consume AP um, and use a fixed value for the enemies. So everyone's going to roll dex plus speed. So your fast boys are going first, probably. Um, the PC you're going to meet with the highest initiative takes a turn, followed by the next, and then so on and so forth, just like combat works in games. Um, once all participants have performed their action, the round is over. Um, combat returns to step four, which is uh, determining initiative again, um, and then repeats. So you roll initiative each round, um, but I'm not going to do that. I don't like um, that. I'm not going to do that. I'm always going to yeah. do it once at the beginning of combat because then I want them to roll more dice each round. And it's just so many numbers flying around. And God, I'm so yeah. dumb. I just cannot. Yeah. Well, intake, I mean, I can't intake digits like that, bro. I think I think one people's critique in in the dragon game is is like like even initiative. It's just like sometimes it takes a while to do it. Why would I want to do it every round? Yeah, why would I do it every round? Like I understand like trying to switch it up and get like a different flavor for each scene. And I think. Um, I don't know if it was Red Giant or a different one where like it it kind of made sense a little bit because like since every combat round is considered a scene unto itself and everyone kind of works right. together and creates this what thing. Was and, that? Like, talks. I know what you're talking about. I can't remember which game it was. It made a little bit more sense. But like I, I've come across multiple games where they they the roll combat at the beginning of every round. And I'm like, no, that's I mean, that's just time I don't feel like spending. If I had an experienced and small party of very story-driven experienced players and they were like i want combat to be more responsive then i would let them do it but i would have them attack and then while the next person is doing their turn i would have them roll their speed roll then or their initiative roll mm -hmm. then so when the round comes around next and we're at the top everyone already knows what it is um and we yeah. can really quickly go but it would need to be a small group and it would need to be a group that specifically wants to have this feel of responsive combat like oh i'm the fast guy i made a hit and then i just rolled shitty speed they're gonna have yeah. to be like oh i made a hit and i'm off my footing so now my next turn yeah. is like lagged a little bit you know something yeah something like that because even even in like troika with the stack like <laughs> if that is literally designed to be weird like that and you can have multiple turns in combat each round and you can even yes. like hit back on when bad guys hit you and stuff so there's a difference to the way that that goes and that can end since it has a um round end token in there you could get like two turns in and suddenly the round's over and you're doing it you again get one turn in and yeah. you could get a round and turkey token but <laughs> i just again like for something that's like i feel like this is going to be quick this is going to be going going i feel like having to roll initiative every round to me just feels like a bog i don't really want to deal with yeah you know i would only do it if the if my player characters were like no i want to have a responsive combat and i want to yeah. like have a have a more narrative because you can create like a more narrative driven combat with that because you can explain like I made a hit and then I got a really, really high roll next time. So I go first. It's like, well, I made a hit and I was already lined up for the second one. So I just win again, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. or whatever. Well, the other, um, yeah. But the other part of the initiative too, is that enemies always have a fixed value. So the enemy score is always the same. It's not like you're rolling the bad guys too. And it'll like, it'll be different. It's just only if you roll, you know, way better, way worse. Does, do you really yeah, like actually, adjust the flow of that? That's a, I think that's a plus for me because if the enemies have a fixed value, then it's more we don't have to roll and the characters can be responsive. Because who gives a fuck if the enemies are responsive? They're not player characters, you know? Yeah, no, I uh, agree. I'm just saying that to me, like, if you're re-rolling every time, but, like, the bad guys really aren't, then you're just determining, like... Yeah. I don't know. Again, I just don't yeah. feel like it's super necessary. I get it. I just don't... That's not how I want to play it. Like, we already talked about. Right. Uh, so, uh, initiative kind of just went over. Uh, it's dex plus speed. Um, but it does, unlike uh, a standard junction roll, uh, initiative doesn't consume AP. Uh, enemies are fixed value. Um, if two or more characters have the same initiative, the character with the highest current HP goes. Um, I, that's another rule. that I would actually say the character who has the highest speed die would go. Um, because technically, they have the highest speed. Um, and I want my fast characters, because it's an anime, and if you're like, oh, I make a really super fast character, I want my fast boys to feel fast, you know? Um, yeah. Um, initiative, is an, uh, initiative is an abstraction of both the character's turns, uh, turn order and their ability to dodge attacks. Higher initiative numbers are always better. Makes sense. Um, turns and actions. During their turn, a character may perform up to two actions. 
Uh, an action is defined as attacking, moving, using an item, a relic, uh, or using an ability. That is a turn. So you can do two actions, nice and simple. You can move twice, you can attack twice, you know, you could do one of each. Nice and easy. Um, attacking. Uh, there are two possible ways a character can attack. A character uh, performs a normal attack without using their anima. The accuracy check and damage check are determined by the type of weapon that's being used. Give us some examples below. Um, the, uh, the other uh, attack is that a character performs an attack using their anima, spending one AP. Um, the accuracy check um, and damage are determined by their uh, anima type. Uh, both are junctions, but you only pay one AP for the entire attack. So you don't pay one AP for making the accuracy. Um, essentially, you kind of just make one pay one AP just to attack with your enemy. Um, in both cases, the attacker performs the ability check um, and compares it to the target initi uh, initiative. Uh, if wait, sorry, hold on. Blah, 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 blah. Sorry. In both cases, the attacker performs the accuracy check and compares it to the target's initiative. Oh, interesting. So the enemy's initiative is also the number to beat for their accuracy. Um, cool. Um, if it meets, I'm pretty sure I've read that before and I just didn't take it. Uh, if it meets or exceeds the initiative attack is successful, uh, and the attacker performs a damage check, subtract the target's uh, defense from the, the total of the damage check to figure out how much HP is lost. So enemies will have defense. You're going to roll your damage minus defense, how much HP they've lost. Um, there's an example here, but I kind of get it. So we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, uh, below is the example for weapons. A character may also opt to attack uh, multiple targets with their anima, like we said earlier, to do so. Um, it just costs one extra AP for each target beyond the first. Um, they're, um, oh, the accuracy checks and damage checks for each target are made separately. So you can attack several times, but you have to make a different check for each one. And that's a huge bummer. Um, cool. Below we have weapons, the stat that they're going to use and the damage for accuracy and the stat they're going to use for damage, right? So unarmed, accuracy is dex, and then, you know, damage is strength. A pistol is accuracy is dex plus two, um, and damage is int plus four. Um, and a rifle or a melee weapon is strength. It, it's, it's strength for melee weapons and int for range weapons and dex for accuracy. Going on to moving. Um, you can move, a character can move freely along the battlefield. Uh, player characters and animas share their movement during combat as designated by the range stat, multiplied by three and converted to meters. Um, so if you got four, that is 12 meters you can move. Um, if a player character can play, blah, 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 there's an example. Uh, but like I just said, I just gave you an example. So use that. Um, using an item or relic. Items and relics can be used during combat, and some will automatically trigger during combat if held. Items and relics can be used at any point during combat on your turn. Some can be used preemptively to enhance the next check. Some are able to prevent the next time you would take damage, and some can even heal your entire group. It is important to read the text for each item and take their descriptions literally in and out of combat. Um, using an ability, the process for using the ability follows combat rules on page 39, which we already went over. So, you know. Okay, do, you see, do you see that? Look at that. Oh, oh. Oh, is it? Inline hyperlink. Good job. Nice. Good job, Inline Rooster hyperlink. Animal. Good wow. job. Yeah. We love that. Um, we're mm. big fans of hyperlinking on this fucking channel if you've not picked it up by now. And if you have not picked it up by now. <laughs> it is my not. fucking it is my legacy in tabletop role-playing games yeah well like when you have johan nor be like oh yeah i add the hyperlink into the book because you guys complain about it. my god great Fuck yeah is I'll that what we're it. known for <laughs> i'm fine with that i'm fine with that hyperlink uh, your shit people it's 2022 also just shout out that guy because that guy's a good johan guy nor um, yeah good fucking guy cool uh health and recovery conditions um at times um, you know, characters are going to be afflicted by different types of conditions. Um, and these conditions can negatively affect, affect your stats. Uh, they have some below examples of conditions. Um, uh, missing a jump over a tall fence will give you six wounds. Um, 
Then you have poison, days, silence, and trauma, which actually is all it's all explained on the next page. So I don't really want to get into it. But there are examples like, yeah, if you get hit in the head, sucker punch, you might be dazed. You know, if if you are in a social situation and you're gobsmacked by a, your beautiful crush, you might be silenced, um, which I like. You know, I think it's very funny. Um, or if you get hit by a car, uh, trauma, which, uh, yeah, you know. Um, next to each condition is a number that represents the lowest uh, a role needs to be in order for the player to begin suffering from that condition. I don't understand that. Uh, yeah, well, luckily we have an example. So let's see if we understand the example. A character is presented with a situation where they have the option to climb an object to further the narrative via a strength check. Um, with the target number of eight, right? Uh, although, according to the GM, if they fail this check, they may suffer a wound with a target number of six due to the height. Uh, there are three outcomes from this check. The character rolls above an eight, uh, successfully beating the, the target number and the climbing uh, object. Or the player character rolls between a seven or eight, failing, but not failing so bad they suffer a wound. Or suffer the wound condition, sorry. Um, or the player character rolls a six or lower, failing and obtaining a wound. So the wound, the, the, the condition number is not the same as the target number. It's another target number. It's a negative target number. It's an additional target number. You have to roll above that regardless of success or failure or so suffer a, the condition. It's, so a, trauma it's 10, a success... It's a success, yeah. failure, or worse failure. Right. Is it is it worse failure? Oh yeah, because you get the condition. Yeah. So like if you get hit by a car, you have to roll at least a ten or higher, or higher than a ten, or you suffer trauma. But if you roll an eleven, you're good. You don't yeah, get you don't get the trauma Even of getting hit fail, by the car. You know? Like So you yeah, fail you but you just don't trauma. get the trauma. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay, okay. So it's just like another, it's just another target number. Okay, all right, all right, yeah. all, right all right. Secondary okay. target number. Uh, inflicting conditions. Characters may attempt to inflict conditions on target as part of using their anima to attack, um, provided the GM allows it, which I probably would. Um, in order to do so, the character must succeed on their accuracy check and then roll equal to or higher than the condition number on the damage check. Uh, the condition is inflicted uh the condition is inflicted in addition to the damage not instead of it um so you can try to do trauma especially i would only say that this works if your anima specifically gives you the ability to do this um huh. if it doesn't you're like you're not going to cause physical tra trauma because your anima is a strength what? guy you have to have yeah. like bull charge as your power or whatever right <laughs> um uh cool uh yeah condition effects so we have all of them here um, each condition lowers one or more of a character's stats to a minimum of a D4. Um, yeah, the lowest die size is a D4, uh, and no condition um, can, it, like, can reduce a stat lower than that. So wound, uh, dex is reduced one die size. Poison, strength is reduced one die size. Dazed, int is reduced one die size. Silence, charisma is reduced one. Uh, I hate saying cha, I don't know why, but charisma is reduced one die size. And then trauma uh, is everything is reduced one single die size. So if you take fucking trauma, um, you're you're you suck a little bit more at everything. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you suffer condition which, recorded, I mean, uh, yeah, which totally makes sense, right? If you take serious trauma, everything's gonna be affected. Um, yeah, uh, when you you know suffer condition, record the record its number uh, either on your sheet or on a condition card. Um, this number will be used afterwards for recovery. Um, stacking conditions, which sounds terrible. Uh, conditions may also stack. Uh, so it's possibly to be inflicted with a condition multiple times, further reducing the respective time. <laughs> Fuck, that would suck. Can you imagine yeah. like you're, you're fighting a poison enemy that just uses poison, does almost no damage, uses poison, yeah. but just keeps hitting you and afflicting you with poison because you're failing. Um, man, yeah. that would suck. Uh, and then... And yeah. then you don't if you heal you only heal one instance <laughs> um yeah um god that would really suck similarly if a character is suffering from one or more conditions of the same type an effect that removes the conditions will only remove yeah like you just said a single 
So yeah, if your character gets uh, like ultra poisoned, the next couple of days, you might just be down a little bit, you know? Yeah, it's double poison, triple poison, quadruple poisoned. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. Sucks to suck, don't get poisoned. I like that. I think that's I'm fine with that. Yeah. So most most I'm games don't stack that. conditions like that. Most times you can't get double poisoned or something like that, you know? But I think because of the nature of this, because poison's usually like progressive damage. And people like mm. the reason like it doesn't get stacked in other games is because people will break it. Um, and this yeah. one's like, well, there's a limit. Like you can only go down to a D4. You can always have a D4 die size. And like it's not nothing of this is like every round you're taking damage. Just like no, you're just not as good at stuff. You know. Yeah. Well, um, in, in other games too, like the 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 there's since there's no like progressive die for stats and stuff like that. It's a lot of times uh it's like it's disadvantage. And you can't get double disadvantage, so it's like you can get as much after you get poisoned the one time. You can get as much, but you can fucking drink poison all fucking day if you want. Yeah, like very you true. already have disadvantage, you know. So yeah, no, I think that's but, more of a like yeah, like yeah. if you get poisoned in other combat, it's you're already poisoned. It doesn't stack. There's no risk to like diving back in. If you're poisoned in this combat, like there's a risk. There's an inherent risk because every time you get poisoned, you're gonna suck more. Yeah. Uh, and I also like when. Um, I like that it makes you worse at things because I think in like combat when stuff happens in other games, it's point values and numbers and there's they're, they're kind of abstract. When this is like no, like you're worse at doing a thing because you've taken this hit, and that is yeah. very easy to understand. You know, if you Absolutely. get hit in the head severely, if you've been hit in the head severely, you're fucking dumber for a little bit. Even when you're feeling a little bad, if you have a concussion that day and the next day. And maybe the day after that, it you're coming back from it, man. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So sh shout out that. Um, shout out that in particular. Um, so hit points. Um, you guys know what hit points are. I'm not gonna like it, they have. You have a limit, right? You have hit points. Can never go over the maximum. Um, one thing in here is if NPCs have, get zero hit points, you could they're they're defeated. Um, and you can kind of choose in the scenario what makes sense for your game. Because, you know, depending on where you are, you might not be murdering people. Um, or you might be. Um, if a PC hits zero, you're going to make a life or death roll. To make a life or death roll, use a D20. Um, if the result is 11 or higher, the character survives with one HP. Otherwise, the character is considered dead. Um, only one life or death check can be made per campaign for each character. If, the, if a character survives the first life or death check, but later has their HP reduced to zero again, they're automatically considered dead. See, I like that, but to me, it feels almost, um, almost a little out of place with the, the rest of the game. It's the most brutal rule in this entire game. Yeah, easily. It's a more brutal rule than a lot of games. Yeah. One shot, and it's not even just one shot. It's one shot your entire campaign. Yeah. Like, if you hit zero once you got and, and succeed, you better never hit it again. That's fucking brutal as fuck. Fuck. brutal personally yeah. um because of the kind of game that i'm looking to run in this i'm not going to use the rule um because it does not make sense for my anime protagonist to die in my in the I mean, in anime in animes it does but in my game which is very like trying to do a slice of life teen persona game like yeah. what what makes sense is they make a life or death roll and on a zero they're done for the episode essentially you right, know right, right, right. Um, or if they're like a side character who just got up the courage to like tell the person that they love that they love them but have to go on like one more mission before they do that then that makes sense you know maybe maybe you know? Yeah. that makes sense um yeah, yeah. um and the points is kind of rehashing um they can never go above their maximum um and if they reach zero they suffer fatigue fatigue is a unique condition um <laughs> fatigue is a unique condition um all characters and anima stats are reduced by two die sides if you reach a an an anima fatigue you have overextended your psychic uh proxy fighter yourself um to the point where all of your stats are reduced by two die sides obviously the limit being d4 uh the character can no longer use their anima and abilities obviously because they have zero points in their fatigue uh, the character cannot recover AP from items, relics, or other sources. Fatigue can only be recovered through sleep or via specific items or relics, not via abilities or, instant, or assistance. So you have to have an item or relic that specifically not gives you AP back, but gets rid of fatigue. Um, 
because there, I'm sure there are items that there are items that give you back AP, but that will not work in this instance. It specifically has to be for fatigue. You have to go lay down, take a nap. Um, cool recovery. Um, characters may regain hit points and the points or recover from conditions in the following ways. If a character gets a night of peaceful sleep, they recover from all conditions, including fatigue, and fully restore their HP or AP. If a character, other instance of a character, narratively receives assistance from somebody else during a non-combat phase, i.e. they go see the school nurse, uh, they recover from any appropriate conditions. Um, some items and relics can remove conditions and restore HP and AP. When recovering through a role-playing scenario at a clinic, hospital, or healer, make sure to note if there are any costs for these services, as well as the time it took to recover. Makes sense. All stuff that totally makes sense. Using abilities for recovery, um, a character may use an applicable ability to remove a condition or restore HP points, or hit points, sorry. Um, HP points, hit point points, um, provided, by the, provided the GM allows it. To restore a target HP, the character must spend the appropriate AP and then perform a damage check as indicated by the anima type. Uh, the amount restored, uh, or sorry, the result of the damage check is the amount of HP restored. Um, to remove a condition from a target, the character must spend the appropriate AP to activate the ability uh, and then perform a damage check as indicated by their anima type. Uh, if the total meets or exceeds the chosen condition number, uh, the condition is removed. Um, if a character wants to use their ability to aid several targets at the same time, they must spend, like earlier, an additional AP for each target and have to make the appropriate checks, right? So it works like everything else works in this fucking... This game is very much like, a, this is how it works, and we're reaffirming that this is exactly how it works. If you're wondering how it works, it works exactly how it worked earlier. Um, and I appreciate that. It's very I like consistency and rule. Oh, and this is the art piece that I really like coming up in the two pages. Um, but yeah, we're at advancements because, you know, this is fucking TTRPG, baby. You got to level up. So, um, the overarms is a very uh, linear um, leveling up system. Um, whenever a character finishes a session or surpasses a milestone, they'll usually level up. Um, there are 10 levels, and they're laid out right here for us. So, you start at level one. Um, except my characters will start at level zero. But level one, starting level, base stats, and your first anima ability. Level two, you uh, an anima stat uh, upgrade. So basically, you're going to choose one stat, and you're going to increase the die size by one die. Um, the maximum is a d12, although, to be honest with you, I will probably also break that in my game at some point in time if I'm given the excuse to. Um, third level, uh, Character stat upgrade, so your character is going to upgrade the stat by one die size. Uh, fourth level, you get your second anima ability. Uh, fifth level, another. So it just goes basically ability, anima, stat, character stat, ability, anima, stat, character stat. Um, and then level 10, you get an anima and character stat all in once. Um, yeah, so it's nice and easy, very simple, easy to understand. Uh, and makes, you know, it's just, it's just a good time, makes sense. Um, we have it basically explains what upgrading a status, which I just did, which is just increasing a die size up to a maximum of, of D12. And then below, we actually have the exact oh, yeah, there's that piece of art that I really like to do with the crown and like the fire hand. Just think that shit's tight, you know. And then below that, we have um, the four uh animas that we saw earlier, but here they are, I believe, at level 10. Um, fully upgraded. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, if you want to look at what an anima looks like at level one versus like level 10, you can reference the page earlier and this page here because it's, it's the same one, Last Baron, which heats metal, right? It's second, le second level ability ended up being the ability to absorb heat within a room, bringing it to a colder temperature, which that's fucking cool. And it really, like... And that's not where I would have gone with that, but that's really awesome. And then third level ability is that uh, Last Baron can exhale the stored heat. It absorbs in order to rapidly bring a room to incredible temperatures. So you just burn out a fucking room, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Material controller, which had the ability to switch materials from one, like from two different objects it was touching. It's second ability, 
Uh, it can temporarily, for 10 seconds or one combat round, change the matter of a medium or small-sized object to become stone, water, or dirt. Um, its third level ability, it can permanently change the matter of any object to either stone, water, or dirt. Um, fucking cool, you know? Uh, I really, I really appreciate that, you know? So. Yeah, I like that. I like that, especially like you said with the last Baron one, like they, they took it in a direction that you weren't thinking about yeah. and it makes you think about and go, oh shit, yeah, that's a totally interesting way to do it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think there's, I, I really think that there's a lot of like very cool games we had because the big thing about the animas is that it's not just your combat monster. Like, you can use these abilities whenever outside of combat, you know? So having abilities that help you explore um, or help you get into places or figure out stuff or investigate um, are like great or it like manipulate social situations. If you have like a psychic thing, like I yeah, think it's fun. Cool. Yeah. It's super dope. I, I like the freedom to be able to kind of take in any direction that you want. Yeah. Would you like to take over uh, on items and relics? Sure, absolutely. Um, items are usable for performing an action in combat or at any time outside of combat. It can range from common consumables to actual events to actual weapons. Um, there is a rarity guide: common, uncommon, rare, and legend or legendary. Um, common and uncommon make sense. Rare are only select underground shops and stores carry these items, and they're usually found in the mirage on an enemy user. Or Legend, they are never found in shops and stores, and they are only found in the Mirage or on an enemy user. Um, there is a list of HP items that restore HP. Uh, I think the AP, yeah. So uh, all the way from bandages that restore 2 HP with a cost of 20 gold, down to Miracle Leaf, which fully restores the HP of a user or an ally for 150 gold. Um, and some of these also, like Pain Reliever, restores 10 HP. Uh, but it inflicts the silence six condition. So you, you <laughs> pop the pain pills and you, it makes you, it makes you a little, little quiet. Um, so interesting give and take for some of these. Uh, the next is, uh, AP restoration from water, which restores two AP, um, all the way down to Lotus, which fully restores AP of a user or an ally. I, it says, or an ally on every single one. I assume that means like if you feed it to somebody, like, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm thinking too. Yeah. There are boost items um, that boost different, all the different stats, plus damage, plus accuracy, plus like just checks in general from Envia all the way down to Grotoni. Um, 100 gold to 200 gold is legendary one, the one that boosts any check by 1d4. Um, and then there is a list of weapons we saw earlier, unarmed brass knuckles, knife, melee weapon, pistol, and rifle. Um, the rifle is considered legendary. Uh, yeah. Especially in if this is supposed to be like a quasi Japanese setting, where if I'm not mistaken, rifles are illegal. Yeah. Um, Very little gun got, violence there. Mine's actually yeah. an, Amer an American pseudo Japanese. Oh, so setting, lots so. of gun violence. So everyone uh, has a rifle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, dark. And relics are objects that ought to have been created by old magicians and charlatans. Some even believe these objects enter our world through the mirage. Uh, regardless, there is a mystery. Uh, they are a mystery, and their powers are known to a uh, few. So, uh, same rarity effect, common, uncommon, rare, and legendary. Same options, legendary not found in shops. Um, there are uh, unlimited-use relics, gifts, and single-use relics. On the unlimited relics, there's two options listed. Mirage goggles, where the wearer can see through the distortions within the mirage, and they're uncommon. And the golden brooch, when used, a needle pricks the user and causes them to develop an anima. Has no effect on anima users. Interesting. So for 400 gold, you can make people have an anima. That's cool. That is cool. There's that's a good starting. Yeah. That's a good story. Story, story. Yeah, story starter right there. Um, there are gifts, which are all related to blood, blood jewel, blood pendant, and blood amulet. Um, which are enjoyed by Animus, loved by Animus, uh, and perfect for an Animus, which I assume you would use as some type of like uh, bargaining or distraction or something like that for an Animus. And then there are single-use relics, some of which are really interesting. Um, the cheapest one is the Glowing Gym, which nullifies the effects of an Animus's ability until the user's next turn, which I can only assume could also be used against an Anima if you really wanted to tweak that as a GM. Um, Hope Stone cures one condition. Um, the highest one is the God's Hand. Instantly destroys the weakest Animus in a combat encounter. 
Just fucking, <laughs> you boom, know? Just gone. And it's only 300 gold. Um, so for those rich kids out there, that would only take uh, uh, like nine days, a little bit less. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. It's like 10 days. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit less than 10 days, nine and a half days. Um, and then you can just buy a God's Hand. Uh, and that is all of the combat rules. Next up is the Mirage. Do you want me to talk oh. about Mirage? You want to take over? No, I would like to take over for the Mirage. Go for um, it. So the Mirage, the uh, enemy psychic realm. Um, yeah, the Mirage is a world that bridges the gap between our own um, and that of animas. Uh, typically a place full of danger, misery, and reward. The Mirage can take many forms. Um, and the parameters of how one gets there is entirely up to the GM um, and the structure of your campaign. Um, so in Persona, you know, there are a lot of different ways to enter your person's, uh, your enemies. Um, oh, what's that? What are they called in Persona? The, their, their palace, you know, their mind palace, you know? Uh, mind palace sounds good. Mind palace sounds fine. We're going to say mind palace. Uh, what is it called? Um, I'm looking real quick. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's called a thing, but yeah, you like get to enter their like psych the enemy's psychic space is fucking fantastic. So um, <clears throat> the mirage at its heart introduces a dungeon crawling aspect to your game um, of overarms, which is great. Um, we, we all like crawling some dungeons sometime, baby. Um, combat should be a large part of the interactions here with minor social and investigation elements. Mirage is also a great way to ensure your party has the proper equipment an experience to deal with their problems while getting a handle on how to properly use their animus abilities, right? Uh, finding the Mirage, the Mirage, oop, sorry y'all, um, the Mirage may appear as a solid red door out in the middle of the street, a swirling portal only accessible on the third floor of an office building, or even through looking, um, uh, through looking into the eyes of a teddy bear. The Mirage entrances can take whatever form needed in order to properly synergize uh, with the theme of your campaign, there could also be you getting on the subway um, and go, getting off on a stop that only you can get off on, right? Um, the gateway. You can jibbly portal. that shit up. What's up? I said you can jibbly that shit up. Yeah, or, you know, Persona. Um, the gateway portal or door. I'm going to get you that game, bro. You would like it. It's a good game. Should be created with the input from both uh, the players and GM. So you, it should be collaborative. You guys figuring out how you guys enter these spaces. Um, by default, however, people ha who have an anima are naturally attracted to these gateways like metal to a magnet um, and will likely find the mirage sooner rather than later. Um, disclaimer, the content of this chapter is all optional and not required to run a campaign or session of overarms. It is suggested to, be to familiarize yourself with the core rules and structure of the game before adding these mechanics to your game of overarms. The mirage is super optional. And like, you know, you could run a really, really successful game over arms and never go into the mirage you know um but you know also psychic enemy dungeon so what's not to love about that yeah nothing um okay uh inside the mirage once a character has found their way into the mirage it is ultimately up to the gm to decide what happens next will the party discover a mysterious anima user who wishes to harm them and take over the city? Will the party investigate a series of rooms that look like a MC Escher painting? Uh, the choices are as endless as your imagination. Uh, while inside the Mirage, a few things remain law. The Mirage is dangerous and filled with traps and enemies. The Mirage is an unknown place with an unknown origin. The Mirage contains items and relics that the player could not obtain in their own world, um, at least easily. Uh, the player character must be there for a reason. Now, what does the Mirage look like? Um, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, it can take whatever form is appropriate for your story. It, you and your characters come together to collaborate on what it looks like, the details of it, um, and it should be kind of affected by what's going on in the game. Like everything else we've gone over so far, it's both collaborative and affected by the situation. Um, mysteries of the Mirage. Um, so the Mirage is obviously a mysterious place. Um, and it's going to uh, bring out some questions. Um, the GM should answer some of these questions below um, and keep the answers to themselves until the players or player characters discover them. What is this place? Why does the entrance look like that? Uh, what is the purpose of this place? Can other play uh, people see this place? Um, why do these creatures attack? Uh, who made this place? And what are they searching for? 
Um, as the GM, try to, to create your own questions and answer to flesh out the lore behind the Mirage. This is There's that a, dope, the, yeah, the dope really, piece of <laughs> art with the <laughs> MC Escher. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's with the first time they're in, uh, in, their, uh, in the, some MC Escher ass painting. That's fucking sick. Dude, it's cool. And the thing is like big and muscular and red. It has no eyes, but it's got a horn sticking out of its face and like a light on its shoulder. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty dope piece of art there. I really like that one a lot. <laughs> Fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, big stretch. Sorry. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so I'm finally waking up. Um, the animas. Uh, so um, the animas are the enemies that you will fight. So animas are what the player characters have. And they're actually also enemy anima users. Um, the animus are the creatures that live within the mirage. Um, the uh, the animus um, appearance are, are, are a distortion of the mirage, uh, so they should appropriately represent or fit in with the environment that you are in. Um, so once again, kind of things can be generated by the situation. Um, abilities, uh, animus and animus. Uh, is much weaker than the anima counterpart, having weaker stats and abilities than most anima. Uh, an animus does not have a user and therefore cannot junction their stats, but instead relies on traveling the mirage in small groups, uh, waiting for someone to slip into their realm. Unlike anima, an animus can, can also be seen by anyone regardless of their abilities. They are visible if they're outside of the mirage to regular people. Um, behavior... Uh, an animus, like a person, can have a, a kind of personality depending um, on their variant. Some are more friendly um, and will give out clues if persuaded, um, and some won't, which is cool because you can fill your dungeon with these weird little fucking creatures, and some of them might talk to your player character. Um, and then you have to decide what a fucking psychic monster from a different realm personality is like, and I think that's fun as fuck. Um, as a rule uh, of the Mirage, anyone who enters should assume that an animus is dangerous and should be dealt with accordingly. Um, and that's probably a good rule um, for that game, for this game. Um, yeah, and the next section is scenarios. And we have a policy of not going over scenarios. Um, read the fucking book. Bu buy the fucking book. <laughs> so we're going to, we can use this and we're going to quick go down to pass the character stat blocks. Um, to uh, enemies, you know, you can yeah. just use the hyperlink. Um, so. so, well, I just went back to the top and hyperlinked. Oh, you went back to the top. Wow, you look at you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, several different types of enemies. We're not going to deep dive this. Uh, this is another one of those kind of go read the book thing. But, um, quick thing: you have mundane enemies, uh, which are, you know are the non-anima user, non-animus. Uh, you, you, you come across people in the regular world. Um, they don't rely on types, um, and they have their own individual values for uh, accuracy and damage. Um, since these enemies, types of enemies cannot use an anima, they are restricted to using weapons or hand-to-hand. -hand. They're regular people, right? People or beasts or whatever. Uh, anima users, which work very similar to you and have a stat block very similar to you and have an anima. Um, animus, which are the inhabitants of the Mirage, um, they travel in bands, they have fixed initiative scores, um, they don't rely on types, they have, you know, they're, they're uh, the psychic monsters. Um, and then we have some examples of mundane enemies, commoner, security, police officer, soldier, ruffian, thug. Enemy anima users, um, which I actually think is really great to have back here because it gives us more examples of what an anima can look like and what their abilities can be. Um, and with a game that's so open, sometimes it is nice to have a bunch of examples of animas. Um, I like that one of them is also just a fucking jukebox. Um, mm -hmm. I like that the uh, apparently there was like a contest winner to oh, like make the yeah, animals like the top two Victor Indigo and Manny Walters. I assume Manny Walters might even be the name of the the person, and they just happen to be like a a weird deer koala horned winged creature. I think it's an owl face, but you know, you know oh, owl face works. Hey, <laughs> owl face works. 
Um, yeah, um, it's just cool to see because we can see like you know their abilities, uh, which is always good. And there's several pages of actually. Um, yeah, one, two, two, three, three, four pages, four, five, six, seven. No, that, oh, well, that, you're getting the animus. Enemies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but, these are dope. You know, these are dope. Buy the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because these are the anime. I assume these are the enemy anima users. These are their anima, and then the next batch is the animus, right? So there is somebody right. associated with these. So that's why it's got characters stats listed and the anima stats listed. So you're actually Correct. fighting like Ian Gregor and their and their anima. That's pretty dope. I love Leonard yeah. Dart. Did you see the art for that one? It's like a a weird red man that's like all twisted up with like gold horns oh, but yeah. then its arms are sized and its feet are like long blades that one it really reminds cool. me of uh like a you know like a, like a level boss from kingdom hearts one or something you know <laughs> do you ever play kingdom Not hearts that game either nope, nope. Dude, you fucking game. suck man you suck i bro. quit bro um but yeah, so great examples, fun, cool art that really fits in with like this. A lot of this art actually fits in less with the JoJo thing and much more with the uh, Persona thing. Well, it sounds like the um, more and more that you're talking about this, it sounds like Super Persona, and I don't see a lot of JoJo really in this. Do you see I mean, more the, JoJo? The, yeah, I definitely do. I think adding in the Mirage adds in the Persona, but the, like I said, the Mirage is totally like uh, it's totally optional. Um, and you could have uh -huh. a Super JoJo game where you only fight mundane enemies and other anime users. Very true. You know? Very true. Very Just true. you and other stand users. And is there like a, is there a JoJo stand where people have like like summons basically? What? Like JoJo, like when they use like their stand powers, they weren't like summoning other things. Uh, n yeah, they have their like stand like come out, you know, like. Um, Again, I've only seen season one. You've only seen season one. Of them. You've only seen the goofiest that what? season where they're using Harmon, you know? Harmon, that's what it is? I didn't even Harman get this Harmon yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, dude, you, got, yeah. you have to fucking watch that. And also... Hey, it's far on down on my list. God, why? It's so fucking ridiculous. It's listen, so much fun. I like JoJo. There's better anime than JoJo. Sorry, JoJo fans out there. It's good. I am there. I like how over the top and ridiculous JoJo is, and so I I I binged it. You know, I watched almost yeah. all of it. When I'm my... in the mood, I, I'm I'm super down. When so I'm not, fucking I'm dumb. Super I super not down. I love the dubs on first season. They're so bad. God, they're it's so, so bad. Dumb. That's what killed it for me. I prefer the. Uh, I straight up prefer the the Japanese version because like I I love that it was ridiculous, but then the English like the dub made it sound like corny like cringe you know oh man i like the cringe okay so we're actually at the end of the book but real quick yeah. actually um if we go towards the end there is um on the last page we have the character sheet and then we have the um condition cards um which you can mm -hmm. cut and print um and hand out conditions during play um yep. and actually the pdf i know that at least the one that we got downloaded has a separate page of the condition cards too so Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, Character sheet looks yeah. nice, too. Like, it's, it's really, really clean. It's so Definitely clean. Has, like, it's so slim. Yeah. And it has the, the JoJo stars. star stats, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Awaken Your Anima. Yeah, that's it. That's I mean, that's about the fastest game we've ever gone through. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's such um, a straightforward I, game. And I think yeah, that, that, and, really, that really lends to this, like, what's good about this game is how, like, straightforward it is. Um, uh -huh. You know, yeah. I mean, I it's super clean. Yeah, yeah, like it's super rules light. The in the process in order to like build a character and stuff like that. Literally, like you just said, like the hardest part is going to be. I I feel like the hardest part would be the almost like that um choice paralysis of like fuck, like I can yeah. do anything. That would be the hardest part, and it's just me like, well, what do I normally do? Ah, something shadow and dark and bullshit. You yeah, know, that's my character. Totally. Yeah. That's what you would do, you know? I would. Um, in a heartbeat, that's what I would fucking do. So, uh, so let's score this bad boy. So, 
Uh, going over our game review scores, I do this every week to explain to people, we have five different scores that we give up to 10 points on. Art and Style Wait, is we, the... We review games here? We do. Yeah. We oh. don't just read it. We also Shit. review it. Yeah. Uh, so Art and Style is the uh, the art that's in the book, like the quality of the art, the, co the, um, the quantity of the art, and the style as in is it all consistent throughout? It's not just like a bunch of different random stuff all slapped together. Um, the layout and function is uh, not like how nice the layout looks that goes in more style. It's like what we talked about, like hyperlinks and bookmarks and all those kind of things. It's the functionality. Is it is it readability of the pages, things like that. Rule set and crunch is if it is um, a new rule set, is it good? Um, if it's adapted rule set, how well is it adapted? And crunch is if a, if a game says it's rules light, is it actually rules light? Um, originality is kind of a broad score where we talk about originality in lore in concept in setting and all those kind of bits kind of all thrown in together and value is uh kind of bang for your buck like how much do you get for the money you spend on the game and is there other stuff available out there is a third party content available is there a third party license people can do stuff with um are there apps are there adventures is there other stuff um for your money so those are the five scores so we are going to start with uh art and style and when we read these scores um, five is considered just average, like bang average, not bad at all. It's just considered an average score. And we kind of start from there. Is it average, above average, below average? Uh, so starting with art and style, what are your thoughts on art and style in this game? So I think the only like realm this game is going to take a hit in art and style is the quantity of it. Yeah, um, I agree. But like the art's really good and I like every piece of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it really reinforces your your anime protagonist game, um, and like I like it, and I like there's a lot of art for the representation of the animas animus um, in the back of the game in the kind of bestiary. Um, yeah, I think that this for me, art wise, you know, it's gonna take some hits for the quantity, but you know, also when we're talking about like art, like the style of everything in the book, like really reinforces it. I think this is a good seven for me. You know. Yep. I, I'd probably put this right around a seven because again, five is average. I think the art is better than average. I really, really enjoy a lot of the pieces. Um, and there are little pieces for, for a lot of the monsters in the back. Um, but you know, the, the book could be extended by a couple of pages, a couple more big, big, big pieces would be cool. Um, yeah. so I'm totally down for this to be, to be right around a seven for, for art. Cause again, what's there, uh, super enjoyable yeah uh layout and function so i really like the functionality uh that's yes. that's i mean that's that's what i harp on a lot in this i think it's got really good functionality i think that um it doesn't have any bookmarks um but it is hyperlinked in the beginning uh it does have uh the uh, before every chapter it's got an additional set of that's, table of contents that's like a big part to me because I, I haven't seen that very often where each chapter head has the here are the four parts of this chapter and just click to go straight to it you know yeah um, i do like that i do like that some of the chapters are kind of small so it feels like a little bit unnecessary on some of them um but i do like that it is there i do like that there anytime it references a page it links that which is something that's overlooked a lot of the time um so i do like it uh, so for functionality wise, it gets a solid score, uh, for layout, obviously the pages are super clean. This is not a dense book by any stretch of the imagination. No. It's not even columned. Um, so I mean, when I look at layout and function of other things that have similar, um, I'd probably throw this right in the same realm as like, I don't know. What are you thinking? I'm trying to think. I mean, what did we give Red Giant? Because, you know, it's very, very like similar in layout and functionality of the red giant yeah but the difference with that is that layout the layout of red giant was oh, fucking stunningly was beautiful stellar. i forgot oh yeah. yeah and this to be quite honest like not my like i i i like i totally get why the color choices are there totally not my not my favorite color choices by any stretch of imagination um i think like the stars and stuff on it like definitely going for a vibe it's not my vibe. Um, so I, I, subject. I think this is going to be another seven, you know? Yeah, that's about what I'd give it. I think subjectively, um, 
versus objectively. Yeah, that, that's about where I'm at with that is seven. I think that it all goes to uh, the functionality, which is really, really well done um, and almost bumped it up to an eight. It's just the layout itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, rule set and crunch. So again, when I first got this, I thought it was basically just, I thought Red Giant, since this came first, that Red right. Giant was just like a dark version of this. And it's not at all. No, like, it's, it's not. similar, but it's yeah. not the same game by the any stretch of imagination. The, the like, dice mechanics are fairly similar, right? You always rule two dice. Not, not actually, well, it's not game, always, always even. Yeah, it's yeah. not always, exactly. Uh, but you, you do the two dice that kind of go together and like, your stats are tiers of dice. And I really actually like that. I think last time you and I looked at the probability and it made like a lot of sense um, for like, I, I mean, I think the rule set is fantastic. Um, yeah. I think it does exactly what it's trying to do. I think it opened up the door for a lot of different types of like game. Even if you don't want to do like a super anime game, I know I really harped on that because that's like what I want out of this, but you could do a different like, knights in the kingdom who summon their like ghostly like ghostly monsters to fight for them you know you, you could do, do anything po you could you, you could, could you could do you could do pokemon i mean even with the knights thing you could do like knights of the round table and have something come out of like each of their magic swords or something you yeah. know what i mean like you could yeah. easily do shit like that it's crazy um, so it's I mean, definitely... maybe that's for originality but maybe it's for rule set and crunch right the, the rules rule are set. good they're super consistent and they're easy yep. to understand um yeah well, that's one thing we said about Death in Space is I like when, if you have human combat and space combat, I like when it's basically the same. Yep. Because I, like, oh, I, I have, learned I two learn rule sets. Yes. Fucking. Yeah. 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 Um, Fucking. Yep. Uh, I, uh, I, I still think this is right around the same as, as Red Giant for me. Like, it still feels like, what even though it's different, Red Giant? an eight. I think that's good for this one. Honestly, yeah. I will we'll circle back after I'm done with my program this month or next month. And I'm this is probably gonna be one of the first things I do is play this game. Um, because I already have yeah. most of it written. Uh and then we'll revisit if I think it should go up or down. Um yeah. but I think an eight's a really, really appropriate person. I think right now. I think eight's solid. And you know, again, we 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 the way that we give a lot of these scores aren't in like a uh aren't in a vacuum. It's compared to other games. And I really like the rule set, but like nines were like Death in Space, yeah. uh, 12 Years, Kingdoms. I mean, yeah. I really, I think this is great, but I don't think it's going to bump up into like Kingdoms level it, it or like not, Necronautilus I'm level. Still, I'm still yeah. excited to play it. So. <laughs> for, for how realistically, for how, um, oh, another thing it doesn't have that I wish it had is uh, a two-page spread of all the rules onto one, one thing. That would mm -hmm. be a big help with functionality too. Um, but I think it's great and an eight is great. Um, I just, you know, it suffers from the fact that we've never given a 10. So nine is the highest possible yeah. and the highest possible is like Necronautilus and this Necronautilus is not Necronautilus, but yeah. like you said, it's really good. It reinforces itself constantly within the rule set itself. It reinforces the game it wants to play within the rules and it's really, really good. So down, uh, originality. I mean, uh, I've never played an anime TTRPG. I know it exists. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, so I've read several um, anime TTRPGs now uh, because I just look like there's a bunch of Final Fantasy ones, and, but they all index towards that, towards like uh, Isekai or Final Fantasy. In this, yeah, I know you can. We're all allowed to roll our eyes at that, but this is fucking sick, dude. Like, I don't know any game that's like a. a a JoJo or Fate or like there's a bunch of different stuff. And even what we just talked about, it. you could play as fucking King Arthur's knights that summon their fucking, you know, they're summon their magic out of their swords to help them fight. I'm like, dude, this is original as fuck. Like, this is a great system. Um, well, I mean, what that we created originality based on the rule set that's adaptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the knight things, but, but for the game yeah. itself, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, even if you take anime out of it, I don't know another game where you are basically a summoner and like that yeah. and your, your other character because it almost feels a little bit like um it also feels like a little bit like almost magic of the gathering or fucking uh who's that little blonde kid with the cards the fucking like spiky hair has got the red in it it's not it's another card game that you play it's got like a blue suit real skinny it's an anime Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh! You could almost do like a like I summon a card like situation, or even like you, you said, Pokemon. Could. 
You can yeah. easily make this Pokemon. So for the rule set, I do like the originality and the cleanliness of it is that I do like as an anime game, um, like you said, others exist, but they're not like, I like this. So yeah. I do think there's a, a pretty solid set of originality in it. Um, there's a really solid you know, set of originality, you know? Uh, Necronautilus, it is not. Um, what else? Like uh, Into the Odd got an eight. Uh, Mothership, Over the Blues are eights. Uh, what's, in, what's, in, what's in a nine, just so I know? Kingdoms is nine. Uh, Viking Death Squad is nine. Uh, and that's about it for our nines outside Man, of Necronautilus. This is oh, approaching Merkel, a nine for me. Um, like, I think this is like, I love Into the Odd. Into the Odd was my favorite game in the last year. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it, oh, was my, are my headphones dying? Whoops. Um, in and of itself is not, go, it's not the most original thing in the world. I actually think there's a lot more originality in this. Um, how are you feeling? Well, if we did if we did Electric Bastion Land versus Into the Odd, I think it'd be a little bit different too, though, because there's yeah. I mean the amount of stuff that's in it, Electric Bastion Land. Um, but we're not talking about Electric Bastion Land. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But like when I think of like another nine is like Kingdoms, and we're talking about like multi-level generational like Monster Hunter like bunch that's like I don't true. think it approaches Kingdoms, you know. And, and okay, again, if fair. we're not looking at it in a bubble. Um, Viking Death Squad, even for me too. Like the the lore, the 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 way that that rule set is done. I, yeah. I, to me, to me, this feels more eight territory. Just in in in. Okay, I'm good with that. I mean, in, internally, I think this is an eight point five. But we don't sure. do point five. We don't do so point eight. fives. Yeah. Um. Uh, super consistently good though, all the way through. Now, value yeah. wise. <laughs> Okay, Value so wise. you can get it on uh, Drive Through RPG. The PDF only is ten bucks, right? So that's a great under pressure PDF. Uh, yeah. Soft cover, uh, twenty or uh, soft cover premium color twenty nine. Hard cover, um, thirty four ninety nine. And then right now, and actually, it's been on sale for so long. I actually don't know if it's a sale or if it's just like this now, but. The PDF plus soft cover is twenty nine, and then the PDF plus hard cover is thirty four ninety nine. Um, <clears throat> and then let's see, they have um, well, there's not a lot of third party stuff necessarily. Um, their Discord is crazy active all the time. Um, people sharing what they're working on, what they do. Um, yeah, I would say for value for me personally, I think this is a six, you know? I think, I mean, so it really depends, and this is the problem. Is it is it always just going to be $34.99 for the premium color hardcover with PDF? Because then that's like our, like, we consider that about industry average. It's like 35 right. bucks for like a 100-page hardcover book with the PDF is what we have figured out to be about about average for everything. I think... Or is it the soft cover is usually about 35? Uh, the soft cover is the one that's usually about 35. Okay, so even so at 44.98, little bit expensive, but if 39.98 for the soft cover with PDF, that's about in the average. About, it's about average, yeah. yeah. So uh, with the PDF, you do get um you do get the uh condition cards extra. You do get a character sheet, which I mean that's not really extra, that should just be like part of the thing. I'm just looking at everything that comes in the thing. You get a yeah, you get character sheets, condition cards, a singles version and a spreads version. You know, I like the singles, you like the spreads. Um yeah, I think there it looks like there are a couple of things that you can get from Rookie Jet though. There's a chase scenario which yeah, is free zero, and the blood ink scenario is $0. The well, blood so ink scenario. Two, two so you get a couple scenarios. scenarios, some quick start rules. So yeah, this is between a six and a seven for me. I think the price is like just about industry standard. You don't really get there's no real extras and stuff like that. I assume it's third party content. Have we looked in the beginning again to see what the licensing looks like? Uh, I don't think it says anything it. in the but credits. They, they have a Reddit. They have a subreddit that has recent yeah. posts on it. They have yeah. You so know? I can't imagine that people couldn't. Yeah. So I'm between a six and a seven on this. What What do you What do you You said you think I'm about also a six? between a six and a seven on this. Honestly. So, um, uh, let Ty me goes to chat. see something real quick. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go six on this because again, right, five is considered if five is considered straight up average. If this was like you know thirty five bucks, soft cover, and all, and you got a character sheet, and that's about it. Like that's it. You get a couple bonus scenarios here. They do have a Discord. Um, yeah, let's go with let's go with six for for value, which again value is generally our lowest score across the board for everybody. Um, it's hard to really bump that number up unless you are basically giving away a bunch of free shit, which yeah. some do. I mean. Merkborg has a 10 because you could literally play the entire game without ever even buying the book, technically. Um, so, yeah. So that gives so 36. us... 36! That's not a bad score at all. That is not a bad score at all. So, super solid. Slightly less than a lot of the games that we've been doing recently. But the other thing is, this is a pretty slim game. I mean, yeah. this is the first time we're going to finish an episode by 10.30. Um, but overall... Like, our secret hidden score is, like, how bad do you want to fucking play this out of 10? Pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, like, I I just, like, it's it, it strikes a lot of, like, like notes that I really like, and I think there's a lot yeah. of fun stuff to do with it. And I think the open-ended way in which anima abilities are generated and then used could create for a bunch of really fun scenarios. Um, and, like, you know, high school kids getting in trouble. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, I think this is one of those ones that's in your side of the pie chart. Yes, very, yeah. very much in my side of the pie this chart. This is a Euro Venn diagram game. I think it's cool, and I would absolutely play this if you ran it. Um, I can't imagine myself sitting down and prepping and running this, although I think it's really cool and I like a lot of parts of it. Um, I could almost rather see myself pulling the rule set out of this just because how fucking just clean it is. It is um, so and, clean. And playing one of the games that we talked about that is a little bit more uh, my speed. Um, uh, or my, not really my speed, my like dark bullshit edge lord stuff. Um, yeah, gotcha. Which you easily could fucking do with this. So, yeah. super cool. Uh, I really dig it. Um, and that's that's Overarms. That's uh, Overarms, so rookie, baby! Rookie Jet Studio, again, um, follow them. Check out their Discord. They uh, check out our previous review which was for Red Giant, which from them, obviously, that is, like, way more my speed, and we loved the really fuck out of that stuff, game. Though, you know? Yeah. Dude, I really like the way that uh, Chris Burns, I believe it is. Um, please tell me I'm not an asshole and said that completely wrong. Um, Corey Burns. I am. Corey Burns. <laughs> Corey you Burns. Suck. Uh, I really, I really like the way that they think about games. I do, too. You know what I mean? I, I really enjoy it. Um, and even going back over Red Giant, I know my critique at the time was, like, I wanted more lore. Um, going back over it again, like, I don't mind. I still want a little bit more. Um, but especially after reading this, I totally get their mindset when they make games and their desire to um, really make it uh, collaborative storytelling between the player and the GM yeah. and not kind of give people railroad. So I really we do appreciate that, that. It makes me... Oh, yeah. And it, it really makes me appreciate Red Giant a little bit more, too. So definitely check out Rookie Jet stuff. Follow them on all of their socials. Um, really, really enjoy it. Excited for whatever the next project is going to be. Um, and that is our episode for today. So a uh, quick plug, besides the commercial that I did put, I'm going to put in the medium, uh, go follow all of our stuff. We just rolled over 500 followers on Twitter. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Here here on Twitch, we have 500 Twitch. followers, which is a really cool milestone to hit. Uh, and over on our YouTube channel, we are at 246. So it would be super awesome before next week if we were to hit 250 there. Um, and, uh, you know, a quarter of the way to a thousand, which feels, uh, it feels really neat. I mean, the numbers are whatever. Um, but when you hit a milestone and, and, and one of these things sends you an email, it's kind of cool. So do us a follow, uh, on there. Um, it's uh, YouTube slash whatever the adventure archive, follow us on Twitter, follow us on all that stuff. Our socials are all over our shit. You can check it out. Um, and that is our episode for today. Hunter. It is. It was a pleasure. Uh, go work on your project. I'm gonna get to sleep early today. Mm -hmm. And then we will announce sometime midweek what we're going to do this coming week. But um, it should be a very fun, very yeah, interesting episode. Fucking, fucking stay tuned, y'all. We're not actually... Yeah. We, can't talk, we can't talk about it. Um, no. But uh, I will do my darndest to get the podcast out before, like, Friday of this week. Uh, but we'll see. Have a good day, everybody. Hunter, you're the fucking man. I will see you soon, buddy. Farewell. Bye, everybody.